everyone. Very glad to be here today. Um, and I'm glad you're here for Robert Durst. Oh, you know, it was kind of funny. Right before the show, I'm kind of like thinking things through and I realized I was speaking out loud and answering questions that people had asked me in my head. And then I thought, oh my God, I've got a mental condition like Robert Durst. So maybe I was just getting into his character, but anyway. <laughs> It's kind of scary, uh, but I'm glad you're here on this uh, Sunday afternoon if you're here live. Um, I'm really excited about this show. It is crazy. Uh, that's all I can say. There is so much information about Robert Durst. Um, I saw the movie, let me let me know that. All Good Things. I saw The Jinx. All Good Things is the fictional movie about Durst, which pretty much just is about Durst and they just changed the name, but my God, is it about Durst? Exactly. And then the Jinx was the, uh, there was a documentary six part series. And I watched all of that and I'm not a big true crime documentary fan. And most of you know that, but that one was pretty good. And it has so much information that along with all the other research, I just had to look at it. And there, <laughs> this, this, the, these cases span so much time Durst has such a bizarre life that I'm going to try to condense this into a short period of time. Uh, and some people might say, why don't you do like 10 shows on it? You know, because then you could do everything, all the little pieces. No, no, no. I want you to understand who Robert Durst was, what his personality was most likely, um, what kind of killer he most likely was if he's guilty of these crimes and um, how this all fits together. So, I will ask you to bear with me because I have so many notes that if I'm like scrolling for a little bit, you know, just, just put up with me. This is a live show. It's not a, it's not a recorded show where I can edit and edit and edit and edit. And then I, it's very smooth and I don't, you don't see me looking at my notes. So I'm just asking you to bear with me through those spots because I have so many really interesting things to bring up to you that I don't think other shows are going to bring up to you. So I think that's really important. Now, before I continue, let me talk about supporting the channel because God knows that's important um, because I spend a lot of time now trying to make this channel good for you. It entails a lot of research and planning and working. And so, yes, we I need supporters for the channel. So there are three ways to support the channel over here. Just simply subscribe. I do get advertising, although it's kind of crappy because I talk about murder, so they limit my advertising, but still it helps. Um, please subscribe, like, like the show, um, share with people. That's really important. And also hit the bell so you know when there's future shows coming up. Over here, uh, I have a book and um, you can buy the book for $2.99 on Amazon. And it's in the description below. Just click the link. And for $2.99, you get a great mystery story and you help support the channel. Um, also in the link below is this Patreon. I joined Patreon, oh, I guess a couple weeks ago, and I already have supporters who are wonderful. I have two tiers, one just generally supporting the channel. And the other tier, which I really want to mention, is uh, a higher level tier where once a week I'm going to I'm doing a live chat. Um, and anybody who's on that tier can come and join me and ask any questions they want to about profiling and serial killers or psychopaths or whatever. We spend a whole hour just talk, I answer questions. If you And what's cool is if you're not able to show up, you can still send me a question that you have and I will address it in the show. Um, it's going to be, the show itself is, um, you can only come to be, in the, uh, to be in the chat room if you are on that level, but I will, then make it public later so that if you sent over a question, you can always go and watch it and your question will be answered. So this is kind of a bonus for people who support the channel and would like to be more involved. And so please join and get more involved. Uh, okay, enough of that. That's my spiel for today. Now let's get to Robert Durst. Oh my God, Robert Durst. I may not see your comments for a little bit because this is so complicated and I want you to understand how things work, but I will get to all your questions later. So hold on to them and I'll get to them. So who is Robert Durst in case you don't know? So I'm going to Wikipedia because it's my favorite place. You know, it was kind of funny the other day I was watching another channel and, and the guy was doing such a fabulous job, just very calmly talking about somebody who was a, a, a 
uh, criminal. And, and I'm like, wait a minute, I read that Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> but he must have had like a you know a teleprompter thing going and he was reading it so beautifully but you wouldn't know he was on wikipedia getting this and he did a great job but i'm not that fancy so anyway <laughs> i'm going to read it right on my ipad you know but it's important because it tells us who robert durst was and then i'm going to explain what personality disorder he has because he has one and sometimes people say why do you say the guy has a personality disorder uh well, there's a reason I say that, that the guy has a personality disorder. Um, I will, oh, oh, just, just before I keep going, I just want to make sure, can everybody hear me properly? I forgot to ask that important question. Somebody just tell me if they're hearing me and seeing me so we don't have technical difficulties during the show. Somebody say, you can hear me. I always ask this question because you never know. And when you're doing the show, you have no idea what everybody else is hearing and seeing. So do you hear me? Somebody just say yes, and then once somebody says yes, I'll leave it alone and move along. Somebody has to say yes. Annie, Christine, do you hear me? Okay, Janet says yes. Hi, Janet. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Okay, cool. I'm done. We're done. Okay, now let me go ahead with who is Robert Durst and what personality disorder does he have? And he does have one. In other words, assuming at this point, that he's guilty of at least one of the three crimes he, he is charged with. Um, well, we know he dismembered a body. That was proven, and he admitted it. So most people who are healthy do not dismember bodies. Uh, wait a minute. I just want, maybe I should ask the, the chat room. Has anybody in the chat room dismembered a body recently? <laughs> kind of a bit creepy. You know, that's not something normal people do. Um, so there's usually some level of personality disorder. In other words, you are able to somehow put aside your feelings, if you have any, to do something that horrendous to another human being. Uh, it doesn't mean you murdered them, but it does mean you got some issues. And um, so what issues does Robert Durst have? Let's take a look. He was the eldest of four children. Uh, he was born into this like ridiculously rich family in New York. Uh, and they were big uh, real estate moguls and they, they, they developed huge amounts of stuff. So very successful family. Um, he was the eldest of four children, which is interesting because the eldest of four children is usually the most stable. I mean, I'm the youngest of three children. And how did I turn out? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but your arbiters was the eldest of four children. So you would think he would be the most stable. However, there was a horrific event that happened when he was seven years old. Um, his mother jumped off the roof of his house and committed suicide. Now, I did investigate this because I was like, maybe somebody pushed her off. Like maybe his daddy pushed her off the roof and, you know, that, that maybe it was a murder. It wasn't. Actually, there was actually legitimate proof that there were firefighters there who tried to save her and she jumped off the roof. So legitimately jumped off the roof. Um, and it may have been postpartum depression because she had four children. And that's a whole thing about, you know, you finally, you know, something got you chemically. I personally never have agreed with that, that chemical version of postpartum depression. But what I do believe is that having four children so close together can make your life extremely exhausting. And I don't know what kind of father, uh, what kind of husband Seymour was that would be uh, Seymour Durst, um, uh, Robert's father. Maybe he was a horrifically bad husband. I don't know. He might have been a great guy. I don't know. Maybe she couldn't stand being married anymore, being whatever. She was rich as crap. So that wasn't the issue. Uh, she had four beautiful children. What the heck drove her to jump off a roof? We do not know. But Robert Durst has an interesting story that at seven years old, his father pushed him under the window and made him weep. Bye bye. Hi, mommy. And then she jumped off the roof. Um, there's all kinds of different stories that he saw her jump off the roof, that dad was trying to save his wife by making him wave. And so she wouldn't jump off the roof. Um, his brother says he never saw her jump off the roof, that they were nowhere near that location in the house. They were being sequestered. And after she this all happened. They moved them out of the house and protected the children. I tend to believe the brother. And Robert Durst is a liar, so I'm going to say that he made up a fanciful story. However, let's, oh, let's see. 
Oh, let me point this out. Didn't uh, didn't he say on the witness stand that his father woke him up and made him wave at his mother on the roof before she jumped? Yes, he did. But, you know, he's not necessarily honest on the witness stand. You know, just because you raise your hand and say, I'm going to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. If that were true, nobody would lie on the stand. And we know everybody does. Um, so now mommy jumps off a roof for whatever reasons. That has to be a dramatic change in the life of a seven-year-old. Um, over time, something goes kind of wrong because it says here there was a psychiatrist report on the 10-year-old Robert Durst mentioned he had personality decomposition, which quite frankly, decomposition, I don't know what he, what that word means. Uh, that's kind of a, a misnomer. I, I, there's no such thing as personality decomposition. There is personality decompensating. And I'm going to talk about that later because that's really important. Decompensating is really part of what you're going to see with Robert Durst. Um, possibly even schizophrenia. So he obviously by 10 years old, the kid is not normal. Something's wrong with Robert Durst. Uh, now, psychopathy usually shows up by three or four years old. Uh, they already start manipulating, lying, doing all kinds of things. And you're going, what's wrong with my kid? Uh, maybe he was already that way. Maybe mommy just jumping off the roof was just an added dimension to it. But clearly, by 10 years old, he had issues, issues. So anyway, because his father is, as I can only say this in one way, rich as shit, um, that he went on to do very, he was described as a loner in high school, you know, not unusual for a person with a personality disorder. He earned a bachelor's degree in economics in 1965 from Lehigh University, member of the Var Var uh, varsity lacrosse team. Uh, and, and then he went on to enroll in a doctoral program at the University of California. And he, and then he met Susan Berman, who's going to be one of the people who got murdered. Um, and she became like his best buddy. Um, and then, but he withdrew from the school and returned to New York. He became a developer in the Durst organization because um, he was the oldest son, but apparently he was a, just not the best employee. So his father was not overly happy with him. And um, eventually they just said, yeah, we're done with you. And his brother Douglas got appointed in 1992 to run the family business. What a slight. Um, and Robert basically said, you know, screw you all. And he sued the family. So anyway, that's basic background on him. So now we get to his first wife. All right, let's take a look at his first wife. Ooh, uh, poor, poor Kathy. I mean, should she, may, should she marry into a nightmare? So anyway, that, well, that's who was on the screen over here. That's Kathy. And you see, Robert is not like an ugly duckling. He's kind of, a, he's a kind of, you know, at that time, probably kind of a cute dude um, that she liked. And he is witty. No, don't, don't take away the fact he's smart and he's witty. So when you're the age of Kathy, you can fall for a lot of stuff, especially when they come with a million dollar family. Now, I don't believe she married him for his money. I don't believe that. I believe she married him because she was enthralled by him at the time. But, you know, it's, it's easy for women to get excited about a glamorous life in some way. Even, you know, just because she came from a, a normal family, shall I say. This is their normal family. There they are. They're regular folk out in Long Island um, and still struggling to find out what happened to their daughter. So to, so she she married this guy thinking, you know, why not? I like and she felt it was really quick. Let's see how quick it was. She was a medical student in 1971. After two dates, he invited her to share his home in Vermont. Now, let's see. Where's that home in Vermont? Um, yeah. So they go to Vermont, you know kind of when you're kind of kooky at that age and like, oh, we're going to have health food store, which is what they did. He wanted to have a health food store at the time, which I'm sure his his father wasn't kicky about. Um, and so they moved there. Like after really quick few dates, they moved there. So it's that kind of problem where the hormones get to you and the excitement gets to you and you say, okay. And she went off. Um, however, his father pressured him to move back to New York to work in the family business. Now, it may be he was pressured because the business he had in Vermont was failing dismally, but the point is his father wanted them to come back. So they did come back and they got 
married. And here they are, the happy couple with their puppy. Um, and so now they're married. And I want to go back to this, or the, this, this picture I showed of the family because it's a real interesting thing what he says about the family. He's from rich as shit people. He's always had a ton of money, highly educated, brilliant business people. And here's, quite frankly, a regular bunch of people. He found them, shall we say, boring. And here is a key to his personality disorder. I'm going to show it to you right now in this video. Um, let's see, where is my video? Okay, here he is. Check this video out. Wow, more than meat, Bob is forced to spend time with the average American family. Bob is supposed to be polite and cooperative and pleasant and engage in the same conversations that they are. And I just couldn't do that. Yeah, he just couldn't do that. He just couldn't do that. <laughs> wow. Okay. He couldn't do that. Now, most people, when they're mentally healthy, when they marry somebody, they want to be part of that family. Uh, they want to get along, especially the family's a nice family. They may be different, uh, culturally different. I certainly, you know, I grew up quite, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't wealthy. I grew up in McLean, Virginia, which was the home of the Kennedys, uh, some of the Kennedys. Many people would say, I live a mile from the Kennedys, as if that were some kind of badge of you know, honor. Um, but it's a fairly wealthy community. My father was a GS-18 in the government. He worked in the Department of Defense. Um, uh, he was, he made good money. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. Um, we, we weren't suffering, shall we say. Uh, and I ended up marrying a man from Jamaica who had moved here when he was 15. His mother worked, well, I think she worked two to three jobs, cleaning at a hospital, cleaning in people's homes. Uh, his father once was a picker of apples in Washington State. Uh, and then he worked in the mailroom. Uh, these were pe these were hardworking people who had moved from Jamaica to America legally, mind you, they had green cards. Uh, and my, my husband, that was the family I, I, I went into. Um, and I loved them. I loved my mother-in-law dearly. Ah, you know, I loved her until the day she died. Until the day she died, she said, you're my daughter. Even though I've been divorced from her, I ended up divorced after 25 years. And even after that, she said, you're still my daughter. Um, and we kept a, a loving relationship forever. Uh, it, it didn't matter to me that she you know, hadn't gone to college and, and wasn't working in some highfalutin job. She was a darling, wonderful, wonderful, the best mother-in-law I could ever have wanted. And I'm going to cry. Okay. <laughs> I still miss her. Anyway. Um, but I wanted to get along with the family. So I spent time with them and I had dinners with them and I laughed with them and I had a good time with them. Apparently Robert Durst was like, yeah, I don't want to deal with these people. They, they bore me. Uh, they're not, they're not, of my of my quality shall we say he was a snob in his own creepy way he was a snob what kind of person does this i'm going to now explain to you how this all works the sign that he has okay let me pull this over here i want to read you about borderline personality disorder because i talk oh sorry i got an itch <laughs> okay i gotta finish this okay second okay okay so a lot of times I deal, when I deal with homicide, I always talk about psychopaths, psychopaths, psychopaths. They're all psychopaths. Um, not necessarily. There's a thing called borderline personality disorder, which is a high level of narcissism, but the whole de development is different and the whole way they deal with people is very different. Listen to this. With borderline personality disorder, you have an intense fear of abandonment or instability and you may have difficulty tolerating being alone now interesting he always had a woman around him of one sort or the other he tried to have them around him his mother left him alone she abandoned him and i don't think he ever got over that that feeling that i've been abandoned and people don't care about me and he desperately seeks out companionship but at the same hand 
because he's such a narcissist, he can't handle not having total control of the situation or having to having to do things he doesn't want to do because he finds that insulting. Uh, he has inappropriate anger, impulsiveness, and frequent mood swings, which push people away. And even though you want to have loving and lasting relationships, you screw them all over because eventually you piss them off. Now, I have to point out this. Wow, man, I don't know what's wrong with it. I do not do cooking. <laughs> I do not do cocaine. Oh, good. Sure, good. Um, uh, <laughs> what happens is he wants to be in a relationship, but he pushes people away because of his personality. However, again, the dude is rich as shit. I'm going to say it's like 10 times on the program. He's rich as shit. And when people are rich as shit, they have kind of the glow around them. People who are not rich as shit, get completely like enamored and, and infatuated and amazed by people who have that kind of level of power. It's just, it's, it's, it's something that you do not understand because you, you know, you aren't there and you're never going to be there. Probably. It's kind of the similar thing about doing television um, that when people are on television, people, Oh my God, you're on television. Okay. How does that make you, so amazing. Well, for most people, they will never be on television. They can't even imagine having the opportunity to be on television. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you know, that man on the street thing where somebody gets like something happens in a neighborhood and then, then the local news media shows up and sticks that thing in that microphone in your face and says, what do you think person we don't know or really care about and has really no opinion that we care about? And that person goes, oh my God, you know, I, I, I heard some noise and I, I didn't even know what it was. And then they go home and tell all their family, I was on television. It's local TV. Nobody really cared, but you're on television. Something that generally speaking is not happening for the majority of the population. So when a person finally gets on national TV on the networks, then that person sometimes gets a kind of a star aura. And that's what happens with rich people. She didn't have a star aura. She was just a hardworking, you know, a girl from Long Island with family that was a good family. He was rich as shit. And so there's something about that. It's like, it's like marrying the prince. It's like, it, you know, we remember what, what was it? What was that movie about? Um, oh, I love the movie too. The princess movie um, where she becomes a princess. Anyway, no, she becomes the next princess of Zenobia. Uh, somebody's going to, okay, I got to look at the, I got to look at the comments now because I got to figure out who's going to tell me the truth on it. Who was, who was, what's her, the Zenobia movie? <laughs> where she finds that she's a regular girl and then she finds out she's actually a princess and Zen oops, I gotta get this picture off of there. What, what is this? Let me get that picture down. I don't know how to, okay, I'll do that. Okay, um, so that, which movie was that? It's a cute movie, I love that movie. Absolutely love that movie. Somebody give me the, the what, 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 you cannot see me? What are you saying? You cannot see me. Okay. I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you see me now? Oh, no. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I, I, I post, I, I, I posted a photo, a photo over me. That's, that's why you don't see me. I just posted a photo over me. Sorry. <laughs> because I was showing you the picture of the person. Um, Princess Bride. Is that the name? No, no, that's not Princess Bride. Wait a minute. Um, Zenovia, that's Princess Bride. I can't remember. Okay. Anyway, but it's the coolest thing because she's a regular girl and she finds out she's going to be a princess. And then she goes to Zenovia and she's a coolest person ever. But the fact is, you go from being a regular person to being a princess. How amazing is that? Just the coolest thing ever. Hello, Rob. Oh, Martin's saying hi, Robert. So I'm. <laughs> that's better now. Oh, my God. Uh, com no, not coming to America. Oh, I'm, I'm completely blanking on this. And I, I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Um, how did, what? No, it's not coming to America. That was a funny movie there. Princess, Di Princess Diaries. Yes. I think that was it. Okay. Princess Diaries. Anne Hathaway. Thank you, Annie. Oh, and, and uh, Pink Lilacs. Yes, exactly. Princess Diaries. Now, that actually is... A very true thing. It's every girl's dream because 
it elevates you from this level to this level to something you never thought you'd be in a lifetime. It's so exciting. So you can overlook the fact that dude you're getting involved with is kind of got problems. It's got lots of problems. And that's what she probably overlooked. So anyway, they get let me go on with this now. Yes, with Julie Andrews, Han Hathaway, great movie. Okay, guys, it's a girly movie. I know you're not going to watch it, but for all the women here, it's awesome. <laughs> but you know, I, I didn't marry a guy that was uh, uh, the prince of, prince of anything. You know, I married I married a guy who moved here from from Jamaica, and uh, but that was cool with me. But I understand why it's exciting to marry this dude. So anyway, now they're married, and the problem is he's got a personality disorder. A fear, intense fear of abandonment, even going to extreme measures to avoid real or imaginary, imagined separation or rejection. Did she eventually reject him? Yes, she did. She was getting fed up with him. Apparently, she, he controlled her. And he said that. He said, I controlled her. I made all the decisions. And as she got older and was doing better in her schooling and everything, she's like, you know, I'm kind of done with this crap. So I want to have more in my life. And she started fighting back which is exactly when trouble starts for a person with a personality disorder, a borderline personality disorder, because he's losing control of her. He thinks she's going to go away because now she wants to have a life beside him. So the, here's another thing. Rapid changes in self-identity and self-image that include shifting goals and values and seeing yourself as bad or as, as if you don't exist at all. Now, do you remember that his father dumped him and went with his, his brother, the second son, to run the organization. Is that erasing you as a human being? Yes, it is in, the, in his family. So he is losing control. He's losing being somebody. Um, also, he has periods of stress-related paranoia, loss of contact with reality, lasting from a few minutes to a few hours. And we do see that in his behaviors. Impulsive and risky behaviors. Oh, my God, can you get any more risky than this dude? Um, uh, strange sprees that he just does weird crap. Um, uh, suicidal threats, behavior, self-injury. We don't know about that, but mm, maybe. Wide mood swings, absolutely. Ongoing feelings of emptiness. Inappropriate, intense anger, such as frequently losing your temper. Yeah, physical fights. Now, apparently he was having physical fights with his wife because as she was pulling away, he was getting very, very more and more upset that things weren't working out. So then when she said she was going to a divorce lawyer and and she had made an offer to him and said, like, let's get divorced. This is what I want for a settlement. That's when things went bad. So then she vanished. Now, that's different from a serial killer. This is what you call a situational killer. In other words, just like many other borderline personality guys, which usually is husband killing wife, um, in other words, everything was okay. I could live with it. But when you pissed me off or I wanted to move on, I had a new girlfriend, ah, you know, you got in the way. Let me wipe you out because I need this attention now and not the other. I'm not getting enough attention in the relationship I'm in. So I'm going to kill off my wife and get some new attention. Well, he was losing his wife and he was angry because it made him nobody. So he was moving on. Oh, yes. I want to point this out. This is a good point. Um, uh, yes, I think a big issue was she got pregnant and he made her have an abortion. Interesting com comment on that. Yes and no. He told her, I, I do believe this is probably true, he didn't want to have children. He did not want to have children. He he didn't want to go through what he had gone through. And I kind of respect him for that. However, she ended up getting pregnant. Now he said, well, you know, I'm sorry, it's her fault because she was you know, responsible for this. Um, which I always think interesting. If you really don't want your wife to get pregnant, there's a thing called a condom. That way you don't leave everything in her control. If you think that she's taking her pills on time, she's putting enough foam on that stuff. No, use a condom, dude. But guys don't like to use condoms that much, so they would rather have the woman take care of it. Um, and that's a reality. Um, anyway, she got pregnant. And he's like, yeah, I didn't want kids. And he, quote, forced her to get an abortion. It's not true. He didn't force her to get an abortion. He gave her an ultimatum, basically. In other words, we're not going to have a life together if you don't get an abortion. Interesting enough, eventually she didn't want the life with him. <laughs> it's too bad that she didn't figure that out earlier. But, you know, she didn't. So consequently, um, 
Oh, no, no. I wonder if she didn't get pregnant again and refused to get the abortion. That's why it killed her. Okay, don't go there. No evidence of this. And one of the things I do in my shows is stick with evidence and not go off on, you know, eh, possible theories that we don't have any clue. Vasectomy is better than condoms. Anna's got it right. Um, it's always kind of amusing when a guy gets a vasectomy and then the girl gets pregnant. And then it's like, is that my kid? Because I did get a vasectomy. And unless it didn't take, I think you're cheating on me. So kind of funny. Um, <laughs> let me see here. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily true. Bob was forever probably scared shitless that Kathy would spill his dirty secrets. I, I don't know that that's true. Unless he was truly a serial killer. At this, I'm going to address that later. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think he just didn't, was angry that he was going, she was leaving him. And also she wanted his money. And he didn't want to give that up because that was insulting to him. So let's look at what happened as to when she went missing. Okay, she was um, supposedly, uh, she was in her final year of medicine studying to be a pediatrician when she went missing. Uh, they had two different houses. One was in New York City and one was out by this lake. And they kind of were separated most of the time. Um, and then she came out to visit him at the lake, by the way. If your husband is looking like he wants to off you, don't go hang out with him. So many girlfriends will go with their boyfriends for that conversation. I just want closure. So please, can we just meet one more time? Well, you meet one more time, then you're dead. So you don't have a second time. Um, so, you know, if you have that much problems, maybe you shouldn't be hanging out alone with him. But she went to the lake house and hung out with him. Then she went out for the evening someplace. She supposedly came home, which I think she did. And then he claims she wanted to go into the city because she had classes and he didn't want to drive all the way into the city. So he said he dropped her off at the train station and she was never seen again. Um, the question is, did he drop her off at the train station ever? Uh, the next day, the, there was a, supposedly there were two things in, in the city that were interesting. One is that the doorman said that he saw her go up to her apartment and the second was that somebody, she supposedly called um, the, the college and said she couldn't make something that she was supposed to make because she was sick. Now, the theory is, first of all, later on, it turns out the doorman was interviewed and he said, I never said that, um, which would be, that's interesting. And secondly, that there's a theory that his friend, Susan Berman, was the one who called the college and said, I'm sick. And she just pretended to be his wife. And was, that's why. Susan Berman was a, somebody that the police eventually wanted to interview. But right at this point in time, she just kind of went missing and kind of, <laughs> sorry, sometimes I just can't help myself thinking of theories. Theories are great, but just try to keep them on evidence. That's always my point. Just try to keep them on evidence um, instead of things that we don't actually know exist. All right. So now she's gone, she's gone, she's gone missing. She vanishes in the search for the beautiful wife of the developer. Interestingly enough, apparently the police never ever went out to his house at the lake and, and, and looked through it. They didn't look through his car. Apparently they just assumed she disappeared, went off on her own. Now, it's possible because his father was a huge, huge, huge rich person in New York City and had great political clout that the father somehow just said, look, I don't know what that girl's doing. She's probably just ran away. Um, you know, don't make a big issue of it. And uh, maybe that was what why the police didn't pursue this the way they should have at the time. Uh, but that left um, that left Robert Durst with an ample amount of time to dispose of a body if he actually killed her, clean up things, and have nobody look at him. Now, there's a, there's a theory about this. Speaking of weird theories, okay, I'm going to put this one out there just for you. <laughs> There was a theory because there was some story about him. Uh, there's a place down. Where the heck is it? Eh, it's supposed to be on the thing. Anyway, way up here is where he lived. And then like he has to go all the way down here, almost three hours, to this place. that has got Pine Barrens in New Jersey. And this is a place where monsters often knocked off their, dump their people when they wanted to get rid of them. So it looked like this, you know, lots of trees and water and crap like that. Well, you know. Kathy has never been found. Where is she? And, you know, 
how did he get away? If he killed her, how did he manage to get rid of her body so well that nobody ever found her? Uh, so one of the theories is, is the pine, this, this location here. Now, the only reason I bring this up is because when we look, <laughs> when we look at um, what happens in the future, when, when the Berman case is going on, that he was supposedly in San Francisco and she was murdered in Los Angeles and the police now saying, well, I think he drove from San Francisco to Los Angeles, killed her and went back. And, and, Dur and Durst is going, oh no, that's too far. I wouldn't have done that. Look, the dude like meth. Hey, meth, amphetamines, I'm telling you, it's not that hard to drive eight hours. So this place was three hours away. If he killed Kathy Durst, Nothing says, instead of dumping her a mile away, he couldn't have just driven all the way down here, three hours away, dumped her, and then gone back. Because if you dump somebody in a place that's so remote and so far off anybody looking at it, you may never find that body. And that may be what he did because it's been over 20 years and nobody's ever found that body. So, you know, uh, it's possible. Then there's, of course, the possibility he didn't kill Kathy Durst. And the only reason I say that is because if you're an investigator, you should look at all possibilities. And wait till, wait till you hear this one. I just have to bring this up just because it's just amazing. Um, and you're not going to believe this because most people haven't seen this because this is just creepy as heck. Here's an article. Jill Biden's ex admits he had an affair with Robert Durst's wife days before she vanished. Check this out. Oh my God. I got to read this to you. Jill Biden's ex-husband revealed he had an intimate relationship with the first wife of accused killer and New York real estate heir, Robert Durst, just 10 days before she vanished in 1982. Bill Stevenson, who was married to the first lady from 1970 to 1975, said in an interview, that he decided to open up about the affair for the first time because Durst of Durst failing health and going an ongoing trial. I feel like I'm missing, I'm the missing link in this case. Stevenson, a concert hall owner from Delaware, told the outlet. He's the missing link? Why would he think he's the missing link? He said he first met Kathy Durst in the 1960s when they were spent summers near one another in the Poconos as children. She was a cool little sister where you'd look over and laugh and she would say something funny. And I, and you know, she was to be heard, not just to be seen. And we went through our lives together. I watched her grow up to be a beautiful young woman. Kathy went on to marry one of America's most notorious suspected serial killers, not really serial killer, uh, while Stevenson got hitched to Jill who eventually married the future president. But as the friendship between Bill and Kathy blossomed, he and then wife Jill hosted the Dursts at their Delaware home for a three-day weekend in the summer of 1974, according to the report. According to Stevenson, Kathy and Jill had an instant connection. Both students, both very smart, similar people at that age. It was hard not to hit it off, he said. Stevenson said that a few years later, a very upset Kathy called him and said she was scared to death, having a real problem with Robert and that he was being violent with her. I think at that point, she really couldn't trust anybody around her who knew Robert, I guess. I don't know why she picked me, but I'm glad she did. I, but I do feel like I let her down. I look back at the last two months and go, what could I have done differently? Stevenson says that when he was divorced from Jill, he visited Kathy at least five times in the Big Apple between December 1981 and January 1982 to try to help her escape her rocky marriage. And then here's where it gets really creepy. During one, I can't believe this, during one of the visits to Kathy's apartments, their relationship took an unexpected turn. I felt like I was falling asleep. I was looking at the table and then all of a sudden I looked over and Kathy was standing next to me. And I looked over and I realized she was in a silk nighty. Nothing was said and she grabbed my hand, he said. Led me back to the bedroom. We closed the door and life changed for both of us. Totally unexpected, beautiful night and no regrets, Stevenson said. The next thing I realize, there's a pounding at the door at 7.30 a.m. She runs out of the bedroom and then runs back in and says, it's Bob. I jump up 
I ran out. And then all of a sudden he screamed something. He had a wad of cash rolled up and he hit her right in the face with it. It was so crazy. And he started yelling, Kathleen, this isn't going to happen, Stevenson said. And she started yelling, I'm moving to Delaware. I'm moving to Delaware. And I'm like sitting there. I'm in shock. People have to understand this guy is a monster. I saw it in his eyes. And Kathy vanished 10 days later. Asked if he thought his rela intimate relationship with her had anything to do with her disappearance. Stevenson said, absolutely. I think it would have driven him crazy. And I don't feel guilty about it. He was abusing her and she wanted out. I do not regret that. Okay, it's getting worse. The minute I saw her standing there and she grabbed my hand, it was all I could think about. I've got to be honest. And if it led to him going off the deep end, I think, at that point, I don't regret it. Not a second. So you're having sex with somebody else's wife that drives him off the deep end so he kills her. And you do not regret it. Last sentence. Creepiest sentence ever. I feel if something was wonderful at the end of her life, I hope this was it. I just hope she had the same thoughts at the end there, he added. Yeah, this is absolutely correct. You can't make this stuff up. Wow. Okay. So, Jill Biden's ex-husband has an affair with a married woman that causes her husband to find her in bed with him and kill her because of it. He has no regrets. And all he's, all he's hoping is that she had such a damn fine time in bed with him that it was her last fine memory of life. You want to talk about a psychopath? I'm not saying Stevenson is a psychopath, but that's creepy as hell. And that's psychopathic thinking. Did the police ever check out this man who thinks that he did a wonderful thing by screwing somebody else's wife and giving her such a hot moment in bed that dying was worth it? Did somebody check this piece of crap out? Well, the police didn't check out Robert Durst. They didn't check out this creepy dude either. So this is a good investigation. Sometimes has a couple of roads because... Although certainly Robert Durst is number one suspect and most likely is the number one suspect, Stevenson is so damn creepy and psychopathic in his speaking that I would check that guy out because he was one of the last people to see her, have sex with her, and claim that she had a great time with her. He could be a guy who did something to her. We don't know. It's just unbelievable. I mean, that's just one of the creepiest things. I've ever, I've ever read in my life. And the fact that he would go public with this, you know, you know, on top of all of this, I mean, you're not supposed to say things. I mean, you're supposed to keep that to yourself. I mean, you don't go, Hey, I, yeah, I had a hot time with her. And this is what we did. You don't do that to somebody. Cause that he thinks it's, he, he's bragging about this. He's bragging about this. Just the dang, is that sick? That's somebody yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I just, that is something I think has been overlooked and I just can't believe how creepy that is. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> and I also question A, that it happened and B, that she would suddenly just appear on a nighty desperate to have his little, some sexual attention from him. Maybe he raped her. I don't know. You know, the fact is his behavior is so creepy. Maybe something else happened that he's, that he's not telling us. So, I don't know what happened with Stevenson, but everything he says is creepy as hell. And people shouldn't let that one slide. That just, that really pissed me off. <laughs> really pissed me off. I'm like, whoa, uh, I couldn't believe I ran into that. And that's what he stated. Okay. All right. So, so anyway, let's go on with this, the show here. Um, hmm. <laughs> Lisa says, let's hope he was as good and bad as he thought he was. Otherwise, she was thinking, damn, why did I have sex with him? And that may be true. Maybe she said, I can't believe I I went and did this with you. You're just you were the worst lay I've ever had. And and now my husband's all pissed off at me because I made that mistake. And he's like bragging about being the best lover ever. 
I'm just going to say, is acting like a psychopath. And he did see her 10 days, supposedly, before she went missing. Maybe somebody ought to check him out. Just saying. All right. But all right. So now let's take a look at the next, next, next thing that went down. Because you say this, this case is, oh, so insane. The case is insane. Um, so then we have this guy. Uh, and I believe Robert Durst has a personality disorder. And I think it is borderline personality, not psychopathy, but it's kind of a close thing, but borderline personality disorder. So now the next thing that happened is this. Uh, this is Susan Berman. So time goes on. Oh, and and it's, uh, okay, Janine Pirro. Janine Pirro, she, she's going to, supposedly she wants to reopen this case. And the word gets out that you know, either she's going to talk to Susan or the LA police are going to talk to Susan, the LAPD. And it's going to look confusing about who, really did what but anyway she's going to talk to susan berman about maybe she was that person who made that phone call to the college and said hey you know you know i'm, I'm kathy durst and i'm sick and she was covering up for for um for uh, robert durst and there were some interesting things that happened one is that she got some money from people and she was broke as crap um, and she got all this money and Bobby, she got 50,000, no, 50,000 dollars from, or at least supposedly she's trying to get $50,000 from him. Um, the, uh, as far as she goes, um, she's a daughter. What really screwed things up was she's a daughter of a gangster, a, a mobster. Um, and because of that, she was writing stuff, you know, doing books and stuff. Could it be the mob that killed her? Well, first, and, and that's a reasonable thought. I can understand why the police went there and therefore didn't put two and two together. Maybe Robert Durst had something to do with this, but it was a very strange crime. So she was found murdered, shot in the head in her bedroom. And let's take a look at this bedroom. Well, she's not doing well. Let me tell you, you know, she's just not doing well financially. And that's why she was begging money off of people. And, and one of the theories is she called Robert Durst and said, Hey, I need, you know, I need some more money. Uh, I, no, they're going to talk to me and not like I'm going to rat you out, but you know, a little money wouldn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. One of those things. Uh, and so, uh, but the person who went into her house and killed her did not take anything, did not steal anything. No. So it wasn't an obvious rob a robbery or anything. So it was clearly an assassination. So it was either the mob or the person they didn't look at at the time, which was Robert Durst. But if he, if she was going to rat him out on Kathy Durst, if he was involved in Kathy, killing of Kathy Durst and he and Susan covered up for him, um, they were longtime friends and it seemed like she would do anything for him. Uh, she may have, you know, need have covered up for him. And if the police were going to talk to her, maybe she did put a little pressure on him. You could just help me out here. And it, even if he thought the money would work, he might have thought she's going to screw up anyway. Because, you know, when when police interview interview or interrogate you, you can screw up and make a mistake. And even if you don't mean to, so he might've thought, you know, maybe she'll just mess up. So she ends up dead. And, um, let me read a little bit about the Berman, uh, murder for you here. Um, more that I can tell you about that, which is, let me see if I can find it. I'll tell you, I have so many, I have so many pieces of information here. It's just gotten ridiculous. Um, hold on one second. I have a whole thing on. I wanted to point out about Berman. Oh, so Berman's house, front door was locked. Nothing was disturbed or taken. Um, nothing was disturbed or taken, but there was a weird note. And this is what made, was what made it so unique. So this note was left. Where's the note? Okay, hold on a second. I put it over some. Oh, no, here it is. Okay, so it was sent. This is the outside of the envelope. Beverly Hills Police. And you notice Beverly is misspelled, which, you know, anybody normally should know how Beverly is spelled, but somebody who writes something under severe stress might not spell it correctly. Or somebody who, for whatever reasons, has a quirk might not spell it correctly. So anyway, that, that was what, and then inside it said 1527 Benedict Canyon cadaver. So somebody told the police there was a body at this particular location. And, and the question is, why would anybody do that? Certainly, you know, what's, what's the point of this? And I'm going to show you a little clip from, uh, Robert Durst later about his beliefs about this, which are, which are quite amusing. So anyway, thing time goes on. Now the pressure's on Durst because he's running around the country. Now his, if he didn't have anything to do with 
Berman's death. He's still sweating from it. If he did do it, he's really sweating. So now we have the Galveston issue. Galveston issue. And this is where I talk about the word of decompensating. Oh, by the way, um, Susan, the, the one of Susan's friends said she was manipulative and she thought she blackmailed her um, and could be. But at any rate, this is what one of the friends of Kathy said. His life unraveled to a pitiful degree, I, Ellen Schwann said. I didn't forgive him, but I, I didn't feel sorry for him. Or maybe she said she did feel sorry for him. I might have written that wrong. But anyway, uh, that he was fall his life was completely crashing and burning. And that's what's called decompensating. So one of the, the important things about um, the, the issue of... Where's my, I'm looking for something here. Oh, okay, things are missing again. Where'd it go? Oh, my Galveston Texas is missing. Um, hmm, interesting. Eh, I hate it when things go missing. It drives me crazy. Anyway, we're going to go down to Galveston, Texas. Um, so down in Galveston, Texas, what happened was Robert Durst was what I call decompensating. In other words, he had issues already, but as the pressure gets on, a person with a personality disorder often can't handle it, especially borderline personality disorder. A psychopath, a total psychopath may not even care. He, he's gone about his business. He's very, very manipulative. He might just have no issues. He can figure it out and get away with it. But a borderline personality disorder feels like the world is caving in. He's losing everything and losing people caring about him. He's losing uh, his power and control over anything. And with that decompensation, he starts to lose his ability to think properly and not do stupid shit. And Berman was a bit of stupid shit. And we'll see that later about why, why he did what he did. But let's look at, let's look at what happened in, in Galveston, Texas. And this is where he goes to show you, unlike most serial killers who have enough intelligence to cover things up particularly well, this was like the worst handled crime ever. So anyway, let's go to Morris Black. Um, so in 2001, Durst was arrested in Galveston, shortly after body parts belonging to his elderly neighbor, Morris Black, were found floating in Galveston Bay. So this is the bay. He just tossed those body parts. The head was never found, but the torso was found, and also the arms and legs were put in blast plastic trash bags. And let me show you all the evidence, because this is crazy evidence that, boy, you, you sucked at this crime, really sucked at this crime. So I'm going to show you all the evidence. So I am going out of this picture. Hopefully I'll come back when I figure out I'm finished. Okay, so this is one of the body parts. Uh, this was a leg found in a plastic bag. Also the arms are found, this arm. He chopped up this guy and they were able to get fingerprints off of the, uh, the, the, um, the fingers there. Um, then inside the bag, which cracks me up, he, he left a newspaper. The newspaper has the location of where he lived. So, I mean, this is really careless crap. I mean, this is really badly done. He left evidence of where he actually lived. Now, we, we often make jokes as profiles like, well, you know, it would really help if people drop their, their driver's license at the scene. And actually, once in a while, that does happen. Well, this is an example of that happening. He left a newspaper with the actual address of where he lived. So off they go to this little house here, which has uh, four apartments in it. Uh, and he lives in, in, in one of the apartments and Morris Black lives in the other. And... The fingerprints do match a guy named Morris Black. Um, and Morris is in one of the apartments and he's in the, see, Morris is in the like one and he's in two. So now they know who it is. But when they talk to the guy who runs the place, he says that the person living there in the other apartment is not a man, but a woman. And <laughs> this is really kind of funny here. Her name is Dorothy Siner. Well, that is not a picture of the guy, person who lived in that location. Uh, apparently, Dorothy Siner went to school, high school, with with uh, uh, Durst. And one of the things about trying to come up with names, we're very poor at that. We don't usually sit down and say, okay, I'm going to come up with a name I've never heard in my life. What we usually do is look at a sign and pull a name off a sign. Or we remember somebody we once knew and we grabbed that name. Well, he grabbed Dorothy Siner, a person he went to school with. So so they're like, oh, so some some lady lives here named Dorothy Siner. And, and the, the, the owner, the man, owner of the, the house said, yeah, well, you know, it was a really ugly woman and um, didn't see. And, and the per, she was supposedly mute, 
which was what he did to prevent having to say anything to anybody so that he wouldn't sound like a man, which he really did sound like because he had a gravelly low voice. So, um, but they said it was a really ugly dude, uh, an ugly woman. And then there was also supposedly her brother-in-law once in a while was seen on the porch, which was just, which was just Robert Durst without his disguise. And consequently, uh, they, they started thinking, well, that's interesting. And then they went out to the trash can. And here's another thing about investigations. Always look in the trash because people are so silly. In other words, if you want to get rid of evidence, I'm going to tell you this in case you want to commit a crime. Um, don't throw anything away. You burn the stuff up. You make sure it cannot be found in any way, shape or form. Don't throw it in the trash because somebody can retrieve the trash. They retrieved the trash. They found the name Robert Durst. And they said, who the hell is this? And the guy was buying some eyeglasses. And also they found in the trash some uh, receipts from a hardware store to buy like a bow saw and some knives and stuff. So first they went over to the eyeglass store and they were told this Robert Durst was going to pick up his eyeglasses. And they, they thought, well, we'll just wait outside and see if the dude shows. Well, he did show. And as he was driving away, they stopped him. And lo and behold, they found that darn bow saw on the back of his vehicle because he also doesn't know how to throw away things, you know. So again, not very brilliantly done. You know, you saw somebody up, throw away the damn bow saw, throw away, burn up your receipts. But he left this trail. And in the house, by the way, there was a blood trail coming out of the house down the steps because he was dragging stuff. And there's blood down, uh, blood trail in the hallway. There were these chop marks in the in the kitchen on, on the linoleum. And then when they pulled that up, lo and behold, there was blood under there and it matched Morris Black. So, wow, you know, <laughs> what can you say? Really, really bad work. And that's the sign of somebody who's decompensating because he's falling apart. He's not handling it well and in his life and he's panicked. And the, the theory over why he was panicked was that Durst, I mean, Morris Black probably at some point recognized him. Now, he claimed that Morris Black and he became friends and they hung out together. And I sincerely doubt that. He didn't like guys that much to hang out with. And there was never anyone who cited them together. So that was probably a lie. But of course, he wanted to set up the concept that he was, you know, they were friends. And so he wouldn't do anything to this man. And then suddenly, somehow, Morris Black is in his apartment retrieving his gun from a secret place. And they, he's like, oh, no. And they gra he grabs the gun and tries to stop Morris Black from shooting him. And then he shoots Morris Black. And... Lo and behold, he's got to cover up the crime because, you know, everybody's going to think he did it. In reality, most likely Morris Black figured out who he was and maybe he went in to say, hi, I know who you are. And for Robert Durst, that was just not information he wanted out there. And he's already maybe has killed off a couple people because this was after Kathy Durst many years and also after Susan Berman. So maybe, you know, he might as well just do what he's got to do. And then he, so what he does is they arrest him and they got like buku evidence, like massive amounts of evidence. But here's the one thing that really pisses me off. You know, being a really wealthy dude does get you some kind of um, ability to uh, not get done in by the justice system. Uh, he never got investigated for all those decades for his wife's disappearance because he was massively wealthy and connected to massively wealthy people. And now he could hire like really great lawyers. Oh, first of all, just really funny. Uh, first, the, the detective says, you know, we arrested him. And then we said, you know, your bond set at $250,000. Uh, what can you, can you deal with that? And he goes, well, I don't have the money on me now. And the detective's like, like you have $250,000. You're living in a shithole. Um, and then he called his, oh, his new newest wife, um, this was this very, very weird woman who, um, let me see if I can find her, oh, this woman. Okay, so he married this woman. This is his, with his current wife, Char I'm in that way here, uh, Deborah Sheraton. There's a lot of really interesting conversations they have, you know, when he's in jail and they're chit-chatting back and forth. And she's like totally supportive of him. She sends the money right away. He's out within 24 hours. And, you know, it's amazing. And then he, you know, so she's, you know, he can always get somebody on board with him because he's rich as shit. Uh, and then he gets the bond. And what does he do? He goes on the run <laughs> because he just doesn't want to deal with things. And he is eventually caught. He's seen up 
at the at the lake house. Oops, that's that's not what I want. Um, at the lake house. Oh, I wanted to point this out though. One of the things uh, the detective said was, "Oh, you know, we couldn't believe it. it was him who dismembered Morris Black because he seemed like just this wimpy librarian." I'm like, "Have you ever seen Jer Jeffrey Dahmer?" Okay, so yeah, you don't have to be a big tough dude. Uh, so anyway, he's so he he runs off. He absconds on the bond, gets $250,000 to him. You know, he's got millions. Um, so he goes, he runs off and he visits the, the, his, I guess his wife's uh, birthday or something. Uh, he goes to the lake house and hangs out there and he's noted. And then he goes to the store. And this is what's so weird. He, he like steals a chicken sandwich, a, a, a hoagie. And he's got like $37,000 in his car. But he still he feels a need to steal a, a sandwich because this because maybe because he just likes to get away with shit. So he gets caught and then he gets brought back. Now he hires these incredibly, you know, very top lawyers. He gets he hires actually two of them. And listen to what the lawyer says. And this is something I find so offensive. And this is really important. Listen to what this when I first met Bob, he was not loud, he was not even terribly responsive but he had an intelligence. He had some wit to him. He's disheveled. He's been through the mill. He's been held in circumstances in which he's never been. But you have to look past that and see well, this lump of clay here that I'm gonna have to mold. Is it got the capacity to be molded into the shape that I want it to be in by the time we get to a jury? Yes. Oh, that's so, so, so upsets me. And this is why I don't like the jury system. So, so here we got a, a guy who there's no question he dismembered the guy. There's no question he shot the guy, but they're going to mold him. So where do you think that story came from about how everything went down? I'll tell you where it came from. It came from the lawyers. So what happens is and this is why I think it's disgusting on which I think there should be a video camera in with these defense attorneys, because I believe everybody has a right to a good defense. A good defense means they're defending you against you being improperly railroaded. They defend you based on the evidence. What pisses me off about our entire court system is defense attorneys have the right to get this person in the room with them and create, create for them a complete scenario, a complete bunch of lies that they will then tell in court to get them off. Uh, so I have worked, I, I, I remember this so well because I worked, I was hired by a defense attorney once about a man, it was, a, it was an appeal and a man had killed his wife and he had, he had gone to prison and they were appealing it and they brought me in and they said, we want to, you want you to figure out if a serial killer could have done this and not the husband. Well, I really weren't looking for evidence that a serial killer did it. What they wanted me to do was create a scenario that a serial killer did it that they could take to appeal. They weren't concerned about the truth. And I looked at them and said, no, the man killed his wife premeditatedly, hands down. And then they told me to go away. Uh, so a lot of times defense attorneys will help create evidence or create truth. And I think that if there were a video camera in there and you could prove that they told this guy what he should say in court to make up a story, they should all be disbarred and thrown out of the profession. This kind of stuff is crap. So what happened was they molded him. They had time to mold him, to work their way through everything he was going to say. And later on, I'll show you uh, later on. Oh, I'll just see if I can find it here. Later on, he said that, um, oh, when he did the, the show, The Jinx, I don't think I have this particular one. What happened was they didn't want him. The defense attorneys did not want him to do the show, The Jinx. Why? Because they were afraid he would say things that would make them look bad. Well, he did make the defense look bad because he said the, the attorneys encouraged, basically the attorneys encouraged him to lie. Claim He claims the attorneys told him to leave out stuff that, that would make him look bad. And he says, I did not intend knowingly knowingly intentionally lie i did make mistakes and this was on a hot mic again he does he, he talks to himself when the mic is still on he doesn't pay attention to that and he mutters these things and he basically admits that the defense attorneys told him essentially to lie you know so 
I want them disbarred. That's my opinion. I think it's disgusting. So anyway, because we have a jury system that no, doesn't understand things, what they did was, remember, remember Janine Pirro, um, what they did, the clever, the clever uh, people that they were, um, they set her up as the bad guy. They said that she was out to get him and that every, and that she would do anything she could to, 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 to make him go down. And they convinced the jury that poor Robert Durst was under so much stress that, you know, he had, to, he felt like, even though it was, he didn't murder the guy, that it was self-defense. And when he grabbed the gun to save himself and he accidentally shot the guy, the reason he dismembered the guy and threw him into the bay was because he was worried about P Piero coming after him. And he was worried that she would say, see, he killed somebody else. And therefore he must have killed these other people. They convinced the jury that it was man's uh, self-defense. He got off. And I love the, I love this picture. Jury wanted 12 who need to get a clue. That's the problem with our jury system. 12 people who have no, absolutely no training in forensic evidence, no training in criminal profiling, no training in anything. And they're up against these, what I consider crooked lawyers. These defense lawyers, in my opinion, are crooked. They got a guy off who is guilty as hell and they don't care because that's, they call it their job. And my opinion, their job is to give a proper defense, not a pack of lies to, to then sway a jury in the wrong way. I think that's just appalling. So anyway, that's another whole story, but he got off. So now, now he is loose and he is free. And now what happens to him? So he, he does some other stupid stuff along the way, but now he has gotten away with theoretically, if he killed his wife, he got away with that. If he killed Berman, he got away with that. And if, and he did kill uh, black and he got away with that absolutely got away with that. Now, here's an interesting thing that happened. This is what's just absolutely fascinating about his personality. Now, mind you, Robert Durst at this point is a person non grata. He, you know, nobody cares about it. his family can't stand him, doesn't want him near him. His wife is dead. Berman, his best friend is dead. Nobody really wants to be around the dude anymore. Kind of, you know, he's not a good person to hang around because you might end up dead. So, He's out there. He's not having a good time. And so this, this movie comes out. It is the movie All Good Things. Now, let me tell you what All Good Things was. It's, it's an interesting movie. It's a 2010 mystery crime movie directed by Andrew Jarecki. And it was inspired by the accused murderer, Robert Durst. And it stars Ryan Gosling, Kirsten Dunst. And get, let, get, <laughs> it's not inspired. It's absolutely, hands down, the story of Durst with a name change. And normally you would get sued shitless for this, but Durst didn't want to sue them. As a matter of fact, he was impressed by it. And I'll tell you why he was impressed. Let me tell you what the story had in it, which is why he got impressed by it, which is so you again as his, his personality defects. Um, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, shoot. Now I'm going to, eh, okay. Um, so in the movie, it says his, he saw his mother die a violent death. So if he saw his mother die a violent death, right? You know he's uh, he's, he's you know poor 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 guy, right? He shows his father as a cruel, sadistic, controlling man. Well, again, poor Robert Durst. Uh, and then um, it shows that his father's a cheapskate, and, it's, and it shows him as a sexy, romantic, sensual lover. I mean, there's a scene in there where you're like, whoo. That dude, oh, it's Ryan Gosling. It's not, it's not Robert Durst. It's Ryan Gosling. Let me take my clothes off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I want to sleep with that dude. But if I knew it was Robert Durst, I would say no. But Ryan Gosling. Okay. So he's, you know, if I get portrayed in a movie, you know, I want some hot chick portraying me. I don't, I, <laughs> and so he got portrayed by Ryan Gosling, lucky son of a bitch. So anyway, um, and then he shows him, Willingly doing therapy, like he's he's a guy who wants to do be a good, healthy guy. Um, let's see. Oh, and then it shows him falling apart. But he, you know, even though it kind of does say committed all these crimes, it gives him some level of sympathy. And you know, once you go to prison, you know, girls will always become your, you know, start writing your letters and 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 saying, "Oh, you poor dear." So especially if they think that you couldn't help yourself. So. <laughs> So anyway, so here is 
this is a phone call. So the movie comes out and you would think he, I said, he should be suing them, but he's not suing them. This is the, when the movie comes out, let's see if I got this. I want to see if I got the right one here. Uh, I think it's. Hello. Hi, Mr. Durst. Hi, Mr. Jarecki. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, I just saw the movie. So I, 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 I have an idea. I have no idea if it makes any sense, but, but you're the one to talk to about. Sure. Would it make sense for us, in some capacity, there to be an interview with me related to what's in the movie? Yeah, I think that's a fascinating idea. I'll be in touch soon. I'm glad that we had a chance to talk. All righty. Bye-bye. Nice to talk to you. Wow. So he loved the movie. He loved it. And he calls the guy up, even though the movie does say he's pretty much guilty. He calls the guy and says, I, I kind of want I, I want you to interview me. So then the movie, he did the, uh, what's his name? Um, Jarecki did this documentary called The Jinx. Now, there's a couple things in there I'm going to point out that were not accurate. And one of the problems I have with a lot of crime documentaries is that they're huge, oftentimes are, are products of a, a network that wants to make a lot of money by making ridiculous claims and then and then presenting evidence that isn't even evidence, uh, or they're the defense-driven documentary that tries to save somebody who's guilty as hell, like making a murderer. Uh, in this case, I have to say, most of it was pretty damn good, and uh, I will give them credit. One hell of a documentary, and it helped the police. So they're an anomaly, in my opinion, and a type of anomaly that I can't I can't argue is great. Now, there's a few times when they did not accurately the edited stuff, and this is I always have an issue with this because I've been edited and misrepresented, and and I'm always against that. And I will show you what was edited, but all in all pretty damn good now what was really funny was he so he does this thing and you got to watch it if you haven't seen it and you, you see him going through talking to them willingly talking to them and then they get to the Berman case which is what he's you know in trial for now and they ask him some interesting questions and what he says is fascinating listen to this Riker why kill her and, and now you're taking this big risk which which big risk you're writing a note to the police that only the killer could have written. <laughs> well, I think that's kind of interesting. So he's he's analyzing, he's doing crime scene analysis, and he's correct. Nobody but the killer could have written that note. Maybe you shouldn't say that, Robert. Maybe that's a bad idea. Now, he, now he's trying to cover up for uh, why this happens. Okay. Well, sure. I mean, me, me because she was my spokesman. All of a sudden, she's dead right after Janine Pirro's doing the investigation of me. I shut her up. Now, this is interesting in two ways. He's trying to explain why he's being looked at. Because Jean, Janine Pirro is doing this investigation, and therefore, he'd be the one most likely to go and shoot her up. <coughs> But I, I want you to also pay attention to the way he say shut her up. He's talking as if somebody else is saying shut her up. And that's important later when he mutters to himself in the bathroom and he says, I killed them all. And you'll see this in a minute. I think the defense may use this because obviously he sometimes takes the position of another person like in a conversation. It isn't necessarily a confession. It's a, it's a, what the other person is saying you did. And so he said, so she would say, I shot them up. So that's important to keep in mind, but hold on a second. Okay, Christine, I'm using your, <coughs> your glass. Mm, hold on. But he's trying to explain his way out of why he's a suspect. You know, they're obviously looking at me. And then he's trying to say, on the other hand, that the killer would have written that letter. So then, which is why the jinx thing turned out to be so amazingly fantastic. Not so much for the supposed confession in the bathroom, which I'm not as important impressed by but this is what i'm impressed by so they have the letter that uh that was written when berman was killed and sent to the police with a misspelling of beverly and in block letters and then they the durst the jinx people give him credit on this one they found they went through all his writings and they found this other envelope this other letter where he wrote in block letters and look at what he says i think it's fascinating I said, wait a minute, I've got to get the right one here. Oh. 
Well, what I've seen is the similarity is really the, the, the misspelling in the Beverly. Other than that, the, the block letters are block letters. How else would you write a, a block letter than, than that? I mean, I mean, it's almost like a, a typed thing. It's going to look, with two typewriters, it's going to look the same. So you wrote one of these, but you didn't write the other one. I wrote this one, but I did not write the Godavra one. And can you tell me which one you didn't write? No. <laughs> well, sometimes he's honest. You know, he's honest. Uh, so clearly the writing matches. They had ex handwriting experts in the writing matches. The, the misspelling of Beverly matches. I mean, that's what nailed him. And that's why he's in, he's in court now. Uh, and finally getting to trial because he's very elderly now and very ill. He probably never served a day in prison. And he may get off. But even if he gets convicted, he's probably going to die before he actually serves any time. But it's interesting to watch him try to analyze this and try to figure out, oh, yeah. you know. And then he's like, oh, shit. You know, it doesn't quite work. It doesn't quite work. Now, here is his final thing. This is the final scene of the jinx, which is he, he keeps forgetting he's got a, a mic on him. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to just be fair to to Robert Durst because I've been mic'd up before. And what will happen is like, let's say I'm doing two segments on, let's say I was doing two segments on CNN or something. So I do the first segment and they go, OK, we're going to come back to you. It's like seven o'clock p.m. And we're going to come back to you at seven thirty. And I'm like, damn, I have to pee. You know, that's usually the problem. You got to pee because you're, you got to keep your mouth like moist. Thank you, Christine. Because if, it, if your mouth isn't moist, you start doing this, which is not really attractive. So, and so you drink a little in between because, you know, you do your, you do your little, you know, maybe 90 second hit. And then you, they well, come back to Pat Brown in a minute. And then you're like, And we're back with Pat Brown. Yeah. So you do this and you get used to it, but then you have to pee. So <laughs> if you got a half an hour or 15 minutes, you're like, dude, I got to pee. So normally speaking, what happens is if you've done this for a long time, you got, you got this, you take it out, you take your earpiece off, you, you, you reach up. Well, actually I actually have to do this. You reach up your shirt and you take off your, your, your mic. And then you walk out of the room and when you come back, you can mic yourself up because you've done this so many times, put your earpiece back in and, and you're, you know, professional. He's not professional, but I, there was one time I remember I was doing some kind of documentary thing and I walked into the bathroom. I was still mic'd and I'm like, shh, they're going to hear me pee in here. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> it happens. So if you're really not normally doing television work, you forget that you're mic'd up. They have different ways of micing up. Sometimes they have this like box and, and people don't understand this, but if you're in a studio, like the mic goes, like I say, it goes up your shirt and you, you mic it here. And then you can just take it off and chuck it on the table. But if you're doing a documentary, you can walk around what they give you is this box and the box goes on the back of your pants. And then you mic up, then you still mic up through here, but you, you can walk around with the mic on you. So that's what happens. You go to the bathroom because the box is on your back. And then when you sit down on the toilet, everybody gets to hear you ping or whatever else. And then this is what happened to him. Well, maybe this is the bathroom. Yeah, that's the all right. This is the bathroom. There it is. You're calling.
Really dramatic, extremely, extremely dramatic and edited. And this is the one big problem I have with this show. I don't believe in editing. If you edit somebody, you're lying. And the rest of the show, I, I don't know how much is totally accurate or not, because once I saw this, I was like, mm, is everything else also correct? Because once you fudge something, once you don't present it, accurately i then question everything else you did so i like this show very much it was one of the better crime stuff i've ever seen it, it served a good purpose but yet it bugged me because this was not true let me tell you what he actually said and and one of the reasons i point this out is because he's got a personality disorder i i, I say crazy but okay um he's got some kind of personality disorder he also may have some psychotic stuff i i, I know i've been an, a, a sign language interpreter in my life a medical sign language interpreter. And one of the problems I've had is when I have to interpret for people who have schizophrenia or have a psychotic break. And the doctor will say, what is she saying? And I'm like, I don't know. Uh, the reason is, uh, if I were trying to, to, American Sign Language, ASL, is done thought for thought, concept for concept. So if a person says, I'm going to the store, you say, store me, go. Uh, that's fine. That's clear. But if a person says refrigerator running street, not, not refrigerator running street, not what does that mean? As I can't translate it into English because I don't understand what you're trying to trying to say. I'm like confused. So the doctor, the doctor would say, what is she saying? I'm like, no, I don't know because I'm supposed to interpret the idea for the idea from ASL to English, but I don't understand their signing because it make makes no sense. So I can't change it into English because it's crazy. Okay, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna read. Oh, I'm still signing. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's easy for me to sign. Um, so I'm gonna read what Robert Durst actually said in the bathroom, which they edited the shit out of. He said, there it is, you're caught. You're right, of course, but you can't imagine. They want to talk to him. They want to talk to him. You see how he's going into a different person and he's talking like he's another human being. That's good. I find them very frightening. And I do not want to talk to them. I don't know. The washer. What? The washer. This is what I'm saying. If I'm signing for ASL to English and the person says, uh, I, the, the, the washer ran down the street. I'm like, the washer can't run down the street. What are you talking about? I don't understand. He says, all of a sudden, the washer. What's that mean? Well, I don't know what you expected to get, but... The rest, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what's in the house. What, what house is he even talking about? Why are we talking about a house? I want this. Killed them all, of course. Now, all I, I want this. Killed them all, of all. Is he Is somebody talking to like a prosecutor and the prosecutor saying, remember the other statement he said? Where he said, I killed, I killed her. Remember where he's saying that Janine Pirro is basically saying, I killed her. Well, here... I want killed them all, of course. Is he saying that the prosecutor is saying I killed them all, of course? Or is he truly confessing? I don't know that he's truly confessing because he's talking in this like kind of crazy way where it seems like he's not, he's got a few more people in the room that should be there. <laughs> um, I want to do something new. There's nothing new about that. 
What does that even have to do with anything? What a disaster. He was right. I was wrong. And the burping. I'm having difficulty with the questions. What the hell did I do? Now you'll notice he didn't end with kill them all, of course. That was in the middle of the conversation. So this conversation is a lot of nonsensical junk. This is not a confession. This is him having discussions with people who are not really in the room. Uh, it's a very psychotic break. He, I'm not saying that he does, hasn't committed the crimes. I'm saying that when he realized he was trapped, he flipped out and started having conversations with people who were not there. Uh, but this is not a confession. And if I were one of those high-powered lawyers he's probably going to get for this trial, I would say in the other, remember this one, Let's see if I can remember this one. Well, sure. I mean, maybe because she was my spokesman. All of a sudden, she's dead right after Janine Pirro's doing the investigation of me. I shot her up. He's not confessing to I shot her up. He's saying Janine Pirro is saying I shot her up. So in this particular instance, because they mixed up all that, they edited, which I think is unethical, un totally unethical. They're saying that he said, I killed them all. He did not say that. He's, it's in the mix of all of this nonsense, uh, which is a psychotic break. Um, it doesn't mean he didn't do it. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Um, I think as a profiler, I will say it is most likely that he committed all three of these crimes. He probably did kill them all. However, as a lawyer, I would say there is not proof that he said I killed them all. That's not a confession. And I will stand by that. And not because I'm a, a slick lawyer, defense lawyer who's willing to lie, but just because that's true. Uh, and so don't use that in a court of law because, you know, if the, prose if the prosecution uses that in a court of law, that slick lawyer will, will nail him for that. And in that particular case, I would agree with him. So um, it, it is absolutely a fascinating case. I do I think he, oh, 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 and then I want to point out, okay, so at the end of all of this, there is the question, is he a serial killer? All right, now, killing three people does not make you a serial killer. A serial killer is a person who premeditates killing people for the fun and pleasure of it and continues to do so over time. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a situational killer. It doesn't mean he got pleasure out of it. It means he was trying to protect his butt. That's not a serial killer. That you kill a few more people is unfortunate, but that means that you, you know, that doesn't make you a quote serial killer. It means you kill people more than one person, but it doesn't make you a serial killer. But, but they are looking at the possibility of a bunch of crimes that occurred where he was living. For example, they say there is a 16 year old Karen Mitchell they're looking into that, that was last seen in San Francisco at the time she was there. They're looking at a woman named Schultz. She was a freshman in college. She visited Durst Health Food Stores in 1971, the day she disappeared. That's concerning. Um, there's another person called, uh, who is the other person? There's another one here. Oh, I can't find it. Okay. So in other words, Durst has been in a couple places or a few places, and he's got a lot of downtime where he's not even with anybody. He's running around acting weird, where women have disappeared. The question is, did is is he is he a serial killer? Now, he is a situational killer. That's one thing over here. That doesn't make him a serial killer. Three people he killed, if he did so, in a situational situation. <laughs> over here, did he, on his downtime, also commit serial homicides? I don't necessarily see him as a psychopath, but I said, as I said, I see him as a borderline personality disorder. I don't see any evidence that links him to any serial homicides. If I were a detective on these cases, would I look at him? Absolutely. But just because he's got issues, he's got so many major issues. Maybe when he fell apart in dirt, certain issue times, a serial killer, when he starts having issues, will often try to get power and control out of serial homicides. Could it have happened? Yes, it could have. But I don't know. Oh, that's interesting. I'm going to answer some of your questions because we're not, as I haven't been able to see any of these. Um, washer, dead body remover. Well, she wasn't removed. Who was? Who, oh, well, we're talking about if we're talking about his first wife. Okay, 
that's kind of a Christine, you got a point there. Okay. There's an issue. If you remember um Joran van der Sloot, is it possible his daddy helped him get rid of uh, um um, um, Natalie Holloway, maybe, because what happens with uh, a person who has an influential father is that the influential father doesn't really want this just complete fuck up to destroy the family. Okay, so Robert Durst was a complete fuck up, and he was an embarrassment to the entire family. Is it possible that he went to daddy and said, oh, dad, I just knocked off my wife. You know, she 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 just pissed me off and I pushed her and she fell and hit her head. You know, the usual excuse. And dad's like, Jesus Christ, we can't have this come out. I'll help you get rid of the body. So is it possible that daddy helped Junior get rid of the body? It is possible. Daddy's dead. How useful. And therefore, daddy can't speak anymore. But would I say that's possible? Yes, I would. Obviously, with Berman and and um, and uh, Black, their their bodies were found, so that that would not be true. So, <laughs> bathroom confession. Hey, you know, don't don't take time. You know, <laughs> confessions can happen everywhere, but I don't necessarily think that was a total confession. Uh, although I will say the part he said in the beginning, where he said, "There it is, you're caught." That part, I think, is interesting. And I think the reason he said you're caught is because of the Beverly, the misspelling of Beverly and the and the fact that obviously he wrote both of them. That's what caught him. I don't think he was saying that he, quote, killed them all. I mean, he might have been thinking that. But, and maybe he did kill them all. But that's not the true confession. The true confession is I've been caught by by the the, uh, the letters and the envelopes with my handwriting that clearly matches. Um, so, yes. Um, let me see what else you got to say here. Oh, uh, let's see. So, what was Bob's IQ? I, I, I know, I don't know what Bob's IQ is. You know, IQ is a stupid thing. I'm, I'm sorry, but I think IQ is a stupid thing. Um, IQ, a lot of times, I, 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 you know, it. A lot of it has to do with what kind of education you've had because the IQ tests are, are, are purposely kind of pushed toward I, the kind of education you, 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 you gather. Well, you know, um, no question Robert Durst had a good education. He grew up in a very, 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 very um, you know, successful family. I'm not, I'm not surprised that you could, you could score high on an IQ test if you did ever uh, score on an IQ test. But that doesn't necessarily mean a whole hell of a lot um, because sometimes it's cultural. Sometimes it's simply what education you've had. Uh, if, if you haven't had a studies in certain things, you can't answer certain questions. Uh, I mean, for example, I'm not a real cultural person as far as cultural, like, like uh, you know, if, you, if, I if I do Jeopardy, I, 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 I can nail the literature column and the language column and if you ask me a damn thing about like movies and sports, I like suck and I, I, I go right down the cliff. And if, my, if the tests were based on that, I'd be screwed. So I think a lot of things are just, you know, people, other people's perception. Is he smart? I'd say he's relatively smart. Unfortunately, his psychology, uh, his person, uh, what I think is borderline personality disorder, affects him so that he cannot think properly. So let's see what else we have. Bobby wants things to make sense. Oh, this is an interesting point. Bobby wants things to make sense. Okay. Um, Bobby, I, I do think that's true. And I think that's true with a lot of borderline personality people, as opposed to psychopaths. Uh, psychopaths don't give a shit what you think. Uh, and they don't give a shit about making things make sense. They just care about getting over on you. But I do think people with borderline personalities want to, they want to excuse themselves from their behavior. They want to explain their behavior. They, they, they think that they have a reason for their behavior and they want you to understand it. It's, it's not that I'm a bad person. It's that I, I, it's been unfortunate. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I think he wants to explain himself and, and then, you know, again, why he, if, if he ever went to prison, he'd probably be very, be very popular with the ladies because there's nothing like women who want to help, a, help a guy who's been misunderstood. So <laughs> let's see what else he got. Eh, let's see. Um, Bobby is a lifelong stoner, allegedly. 
yeah, he smoked. Apparently, he was heavily into into kind of different kinds of drugs, and that may again be one of the reasons he did such shitty crimes, uh, because at the moment he might not have been all that. You know, his brain might have been not quite working right. So, in other words, when you drink, when you smoke weed, when you do coke, when you do meth, you get weird perceptions of things. So. Uh, one of the things that happens with any kind of speed, uh, which will be meth or cocaine or amphetamines, is that you think you can, you think you're on top of the world, you can, you can do anything and you can beat anything. And so a lot of times you just don't think anything can happen to you. So you say, hey, I can, I can write this note and send it to the police and they'll find, they'll find uh, Susan's body and they'll be, all be over. Well, yeah, if you want to go to prison, but you're not thinking clearly. So I think he does, has had an issue with uh, too, way too many drugs. Um, let's see what we got. Here. Uh, and I'm going to, things like this, uh, was Richard Speck a serial killer and murderer? He took eight student users into the next room and one by one killed them. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to, I have to actually on, on a, eventually do a whole thing on Richard Speck. So I'm not going to comment on it here because I, quite frankly, I can't entirely remember his whole, you know, psychology and his crimes. So sometimes when people ask me questions, I'm like, why can't you answer it right away? I'm like so many crimes in my head, I can't remember anything. So I will definitely put him on the list of things to look at because he's an interesting, he's an interesting um, uh, part of history. And I will then review that and see if I can come back to you on that. But I will try. So let's see what else we have for, for, for questions. Um, I'm going backwards now. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I agree 150% about juries and defense lawyers. Oh, my God. We have it, – it's my soapbox thing. I mean, if anybody knows me, I'm on a soapbox about jury system. Um, and it's not that – I'm not angry with the people on the jury. Please understand that. It's not their fault. They're doing, trying to do their citizen's duty, and they think they're doing the right thing. The fact is they've got no ability to do the right thing. And it's because once upon a time way back in maybe the medieval ages, you know, you didn't have DNA. You didn't have great crime scene analysis. What you had was, um, what you had was dude came up and speared this guy. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I saw him. Um, now we've got such complicated cases, and we have such – well-trained attorneys to manipulate. They're almost like, oh my God, um, they're a showman. They're showman. It's a, a dog and pony show. It's just, it's, it's, it's sad because people aren't getting there to tell you the truth. They're, and they're, they're there to confuse you and to, to make you believe something that necess isn't necessarily even true. And you have two experts giving completely different perspectives on things. And, and mind you, I'm one of these people that is okay with people having different opinions. So you have two experts. Let's say I have an opinion on a crime and another uh, person has an opinion on a crime. I'm willing to say, okay, let's look at both of our, our viewpoints on that and try to figure out where, where things make sense and, and, and what we're contributing uh, rather than saying he's an ass and you're an ass, uh, you know, you're a fraud, you're a fraud, you know, Rather than do that, let's see if we can learn something from this. But when you get into a court of law, this is not the place to play those, to play games with a jury. A jury who has zero training, zero, zero training. And we wouldn't hire a mechanic who didn't know anything about cars. We wouldn't have a person decide on rocket science stuff who never took physics. It's insanity to have 12 people off a freaking bus stop. I always call it the bus stop. You pull 12 people off a bus stop who can't figure out how to get out of jury duty. And you say, okay, you sit there and you figure out what this, if this PhD is lying to you, you figure out if this top expert is lying to you, you figure out if this attorneys are lying to you, the prosecution, the defense, you figure it out. Do you know that I'm not allowed to, to, uh, to testify in court? Do you know why I'm not allowed to testify in court? And some Certain profiles out there will say it's because you are not really a profile. No, the problem is I don't have a PhD and I didn't follow the certain pattern of how you get into, you know, I didn't tell I didn't, I don't have a PhD in uh, forensic science. I don't have a PhD in psychology. They won't let me into court because my background is not appropriate. They won't let me testify to help figure out who 
is guilty. But they'll let 12 people off a bus stop who had zero training make a life and death decision. It's insanity. And I have been fighting this for years for a professional jury system that would have people like me on the jury who have no emotional investment, who have no, they, they actually know what they're looking at. And they can't be played by the two different, uh, the prosecutor and the, and, and the defense attorney. We can't be played because this is our job, but that has not come into being in the United States at this point. So let's, let's see what you have to say. Uh, Bruce says, most of us can't even think of doing harm to someone just because they have displeased us. Yeah, because most of us aren't psychopaths or borderline personality disorders, we understand that life is not always as we wish. We understand that, you know, maybe someone doesn't like us as much as we wish they would like us. Maybe we understand that we're going to have to suffer consequences and move on. Uh, and therefore, thank God, most people think that way. Um, absolutely, most people think that way. Uh, but the people who don't think that way, because they have personality disorders, will then strike out because they cannot accept the loss. They cannot accept that someone doesn't like them as much as they wish they would, or that someone is going to take half their money, or that someone is going to disparage them, or whatever it is. Uh, it's an ego. It's an ego-driven thing where uh, I can't allow somebody to hurt my ego. Um, and that's narcissism. Uh, a narcissist cannot accept any kind of blow to the ego, whereas a person who's not a narcissist can say, opinion is different. <laughs> Don't like me. Yeah, sucks, but oh well, you know, I'll get over it. But that that's uh, that's healthy. Let's see. <laughs> Martin says, if my life were made into a movie, I think George Clooney or Brad Pitt would be most likely be in the lead role. All right. <laughs> you might as well go. You might as well go for some. Although they're getting older now, Martin. I don't know how old you are now, but George and Brad are both getting a lot older now. So might want to like, you might wanna, like uh, young down your you know, so you get somebody with a really hot chest, you know, that's, that's, that's important <laughs> to have a hot chest. <laughs> Let's see what else we've got here. Oh, that's interesting. That's a good point, Anna. Defense attorneys are doing the opposite of what you are teaching us. They theorize while ignoring evidence. That equals reasonable doubt equals acquittal. Yeah, and, and the whole point is the reasonable doubt issue. I like how you point that out, Anna. The reasonable doubt should be. Now, let's say there's two different forms. There's reasonable doubt that should be. In other words, I've got a lot of reasons why I think it could be that person, but the evidence is not strong enough to support it. Then you've got the reasonable doubt that defense attorneys point out, which is a man from Mars could have killed that person. And the, and the jury goes, yeah, now I've heard there are Martians around and maybe they did. That's the kind of stuff that really pisses me off that you can present Reasonable doubt by confusing the jury with a bunch of nonsense because the jury doesn't understand because the jury is trying to, they're trying to be good people. They're trying to be fair. They're trying not to, to railroad somebody. And so once they get that concept of quote, reasonable doubt, in other words, you know, there's like a hundred reasons they did it, but there's just one thing I can't explain. So that's reasonable doubt. No, that's not true. The totality of the evidence should be enough, but the concept of reasonable doubt it's gotten so out of whack that basically if you have any question about one piece of evidence, let's say, for example, you got, you got, you got a, a guy who's on trial for the murder, rape and murder of a woman. He was, he was seen running from the woman's house, carrying a bloody knife in his hand, screaming, I killed the bitch. I killed the bitch. And then they go to court and they find out that the DNA in the woman does not match the guy who was running from the house screaming, I killed the bitch, I killed the bitch. The defense attorney will say, see, there's no proof there that he actually raped that woman or killed her. Even though he said that, he might have gotten there and found the knife. And since he didn't, since his DNA wasn't there, somebody else obviously raped her and he just picked up the knife and in a frenzy, he ran from the house imagining what the guy would have said, which is I killed the bitch. No, really what happened was she had sex with somebody and then and then this DNA was from somebody else that she had, an, an, you know, like a get together with. And then the rapist came in, used a condom and the commission of the crime, raped the woman, murdered her, ran from the house with a blade. And I said, I killed the bitch. I killed the bitch. But the DNA is not his. Now, so they say so then the, the defense attorney says, well, you know, the police asked everybody in town if they had sex with that woman. 
and nobody would admit it. <laughs> would you admit it? Would you admit you had sex with a woman that ended up raped and murdered? Probably not. So you're hiding in a cave someplace. And there's clear evidence of the guy running from the place with a bloody knife killed the woman. But the jury lets him off because the DNA didn't match him. That's the kind of thing that happens. If I run the jury, that guy'd be in prison. You know, and he'd be getting life or, or death penalty. Or at least life, you know. Um, let's see. Wait, oh, this is... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Anna says some European countries, France, for example, example, use a tri triumvirate of judges. I think this goes back to Napoleonic law. I don't know about Germany. I think it is similar. I think it is too. Uh, they use three judges. And, and the, our problem in this United States is that we think that all the judges are politically inclined and they're all going to do the bidding of the government. Uh, some part of me agrees with that, but that's why I kind of go for a professional jury. It expands it a little bit. It puts professional people rather than judges there. And the professional people can make that determination. We could have people trained to be professional jurors, um, people like me, uh, or other people who go through a whole process of learning criminal, you know, all the issues about crime scene evidence and behavioral profiling, blah, blah, blah. Some great course. They do their studies, they pass a test, they become professional jurors. And then they don't get their emotions caught up in it. And they don't get that, like, not coming in completely, like, with zero knowledge of anything. And I think that would be the best system, but there you go. I'm kind of like one of the people that says that. A problem is the mantra you hear all the time. The U.S. justice system is the best in the world. Said by people who have no experience of how uh, of, uh, uh, of how other developed countries run their jury system. Oh, my God, I hear that all the time. Yeah, we're the best in the world. We're a disaster. We, 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 we incarcerate people who aren't guilty. Uh, because I know because I've worked cases where I know the guy didn't do it, but they just picked out, they just picked out another creepy guy that didn't do it. And they let the real guy walk. I've seen cases like Casey Anthony work. In my opinion is clear as hell. OJ Simpson clear as hell. Um, and they let them walk because of emotions. And so, yeah, uh, I'm not just so fond of our jury system. I, I really am not fond of it. Let's see what else we got here. Um, so yeah, I, so they say, you know, the jury system needs to be fixed, but it will be interesting. I think what in this, oh, that's a good point. Uh, in his current trial, the prosecution has to introduce the whole statement. They may, um, yeah, and they should. Uh, and it, it, the statement is, it's, there's a lot of interesting stuff in the statement as it is. I just, I just object to any kind of show not presenting things accurately and anytime anything is edited it pisses me off because it sheds it what it does is it makes you doubt the veracity of everything else they presented so i did like the jinx generally speaking but now because of the final scene i say was was there other stuff that was manipulated i can't trust you you manipulated the final res, the final scene and now did you manipulate everything else as well? And that bugs me. It's kind of like I've always told my kids, the reason you don't lie is because once you tell a lie, no one trusts you ever again. Because if you lie about this, how do I know you're not lying about that? I absolutely hate lying. I mean, it's just I have a big thing against lying. Um, big thing against lying. And so I don't want to see it in court. I don't want to see it in, in media. And that's why I don't do media anymore because they they have manipulated what I've said. They've edited what I said to what, what they presented was not what I said. Now I'm on YouTube. Yay. So what you hear here is exactly what I said. You may not like it. You may not agree with it. You may think oh, whatever you want to think, but it is what I said. Now, if you go to another channel and they, and I've already had this happen, they will then suck stuff off of this channel and put it on another channel and edit it out. And now you're hearing what you think Pat Brown said, which is frustrating because once you're public, they can edit the crap out of you elsewhere. But at least if nothing else, you can come to the source. I am here. You will hear what I say. At least you'll know I said it. And, and so to me, I'm very, very, once, once you start editing stuff out, I don't trust you anymore. And it's a shame because most of the jinx I thought was pretty cool, but now I just go, now, does that mean I particularly think that Robert Durst is not guilty of three crimes? No, it's not that I'm thinking that. It's just I don't like to be manipulated, and I think nobody should be manipulated. You don't need to do that. There wasn't even a necessity to do that with Durst. I mean, there's so much evidence. You don't need to go there. Um, 
Oh, uh, I don't think anybody does main media anymore. Julia, that's not true, unfortunately. Netflix is huge. Um, Discovery Channel is huge. And I've done work with Discovery Channel. Um, and when I did work, uh, the, uh, the, the mysterious death of Cleopatra was one of the things I did with Discovery. Uh, it was it was a good it was a pretty good documentary considering, um, and I'm I'm pleased with it. Um, I I'm going to do something here on, on 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 Cleopatra, what really happened to Cleopatra based on my book, which is called uh, The Murder of Cleopatra. You can find it at Amazon. Um, uh, I want to do more here because Discovery Channel only did a little bit, and I haven't been able to do the full the full information and I did get edited, not in a terrible way, but just edited enough where I wish I got the rest of it out. But it's a, you know, it's an hour long documentary. So you, know, you get what you get. But I do think people still believe Netflix highly, Discovery, uh, 48 hours, uh, Inside Edition. And I've worked for all of these people and I know that they aren't necessarily concerned about accuracy. They want a good story. And that pisses me off because there's so many good stories out there that you don't have to be a liar about it. Um, you don't have to be inaccurate. You can tell the truth. Um, but the problem is, you know, when you tell the truth, you might make this money, but when you do this, you make that money. And, and it's just the reason I'm doing this channel. I mean, I'm happy with this money. <laughs> I don't need to make this money. You know, I don't need to lie to you because it's just not worth it to me. Uh, but you know, that's the way it goes. Um, Lisa says, disappointing to know the edited ending. Yes, it undermines the story. And it may be the, you know, the funny thing, Lisa, is the entire rest of the story could be true. 100% could be true. But do we know that now? Because if you're willing to do one thing, you're willing to do another thing. And that's what that's what screws you over. Um, oh, I meant to get there. Oh, new, Netflix is always right these days. Yeah, uh, Netflix has as a massive moneymaker these days. And you know, they do put out some good stuff. So, you know, it's, it's, I try to be fair that sometimes stuff is good. Um, I enjoy some shows. I've been occasionally enjoy a documentary. I appreciate being able to access certain things. I do have a Netflix account. Um, but there are things that upset me because I, I think it's unnecessary. I always wonder why do you need to make that much extra money you know why when you're already making money you know it's kind of like robbery i mean i always it's like okay i understand why you stole bread to feed your child but you're already surviving you're eating you had a place to live you had a car did you really think it was necessary to rob somebody of 20 dollars? i mean I, I never understand that well as a profiler i understand it here but here i'm like did you really need to do that so you know if you're doing television, if you're doing writing books, do you really need to lie? I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess, well, I guess, you know, if I wanted to make a shitload of money, I guess I could write a real tell all book, which maybe would tell things that aren't even true. Uh, and, and I could walk away with half a mil. Um, but you know, I don't need it and I won't do it, but it's a shame that so many people already, are making a book book of money. They don't need to do this. And so I just wish our ethics would raise up a little bit. And people who have control of the media, people who have control of storytelling, would just tell the truth. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> Lisa says, we appreciate the unedited Pat Brown. Thank you. And, and, and this is, uh, you know, that's, that's one thing cool about YouTube that I can actually sit here and say what I want and people who like what I say can come here and people who don't like what I say can go away. And, <laughs> but I have freedom and that's, that's really kind of a nice thing. Now that doesn't mean YouTube can't like knock me off one day because I say something I disagree with and they don't want me on, but yeah. Um, you know, nothing's, nothing lasts forever. Nothing's perfect, but I do appreciate YouTube right now because I finally free of television. Now I'm not saying I would never do television again. I don't do television at the moment. But if somebody came to me uh, with a really good thing, like if somebody said, Pat, we want to do your st stuff on Cleopatra. We want to do a six-part series. In case you're listening out there, any 
any big major uh, uh, people. Uh, we want to do, finally, we want to do the truth about Cleopatra. You've written a great book on Cleopatra. We've seen you've done all the studies and the research and you've gone to Egypt and you've gotten all the evidence. We really want to do a whole series on that instead of just one show. And I say to them, okay, I want control. I want to make sure that as the host of this, as the profile of this, that my information goes through properly. And they agree and we sign a contract. I will do that. But I will never do documentaries anymore that I just brought in as an expert and then and I come in and say my piece and they edit me and then I look like an idiot and they trash me and and they 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 edit out my words. I will never do that again. It's not worth the money and it's not worth just I don't and that it's not even so much the attack on my character. It's that people are getting misinformation. I'm trying to give them the real information. Oh, which reminds me. Next week I'm going to do a show on Martha Moxley. Uh, I did the Oxygen show, and somebody just told me recently they were, they were watching Oxygen Channel, and the Martha Moxley case came up, and they were like, oh, I wish Pat Brown would talk about this. And I showed up on the show, and I said stuff, and guess what? That show slandered me. That show edited me. And that show, that show, uh, that was the last show I did for a documentary because I never trusted documentaries after that. That was the last one I did. I am going to do Martha Moxley next week the real Martha Moxley documentary on my show because I will not be edited and I will give you the evidence that I discovered in the Martha Moxley case and what I believe actually happened to Martha Moxley and uh, why I believe that Ma Michael Skakel did not kill Martha Moxley. And uh, so join me next week for that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Lorraine. I, I agree. I hate lies. Love your principles. Yeah, I'd rather be hated for, you know, I'd rather be hated for being me. You know, my personality doesn't agree with everybody. Um, and I'd rather have people say, you know, I just can't stand you <laughs> than to think I'm a liar. You know, I'd rather have that. And I think that that would be, that's okay with me. You know, everybody has their own taste. And, and that's inc that's great. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Martha Moxley. Yes, I was asked to do this. And uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm excited to do this show because I'd like to yes, I tell the what I actually know about the evidence. And um, it's a fascinating case. And it has been uh, uh, Michael Skakel is now free. He is not going to be going back to court. Um, they're not going to retry him because they don't have enough evidence. Yeah. No, no kidding. And. Oh, there's so much. Uh, it's going to be a great show because it's going to be really, really interesting. Really, really interesting. Oh, Julia says, you've got me super interested in Cleopatra. Did you really write a book on her? Yes, I did. Um, it's called The Murder. I did. The, you can first, you can see The Mysterious Death of Cleopatra. It's on Discovery Channel. And it should be, it should be on YouTube someplace. Um, and what I did was I got rid of the snake. Um, the claim was for, for 2,000 years, a, a snake, she died from a snake bite from a cobra. And that's garbage. And so what I did was I proved that that she did not get killed by a snake. And after I proved that on discovery, all the historians and Egyptologists tossed the snake out of their <laughs> out of their books. And up until that point, everybody said she died by a snake. And now everybody's tossed the snake out. Nobody mentions me, of course, you know, because you don't do that. You know, you just say, oh, I came up with this idea. And so now the snake is missing, but uh, I didn't get credit. But anyway, it's good. The snake is gone. Um, but after I get rid of the snake on discovery, I realized there was so much more to what happened to her. She, she did not commit suicide. She was murdered. And so I went back and to Egypt and I studied, I studied everything about Cleopatra, read every book ever existed on Cleopatra. I studied, I studied shipbuilding. I studied e Egyptian uh, uh, architecture. I studied the Nile inundations. I studied uh, the war warfare of Rome at the time. I studied a huge bunch of stuff. And then I went back to Egypt. I went back to Egypt and I started, I went around Egypt studying the things that I needed to study. And then I wrote, uh, the murder of Cleopatra it came out. I can't remember. Uh, Prometheus books put it out. Um, I got a little bit of, little bit of publicity through the Smithsonian, but I'm not real, um, connected to the right people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I didn't get a lot of publicity. Uh, so the book has come and kind of gone quietly. And um, it's sad because I really believe that Cleopatra was misrepresented in history tremendously. Not just because, oh, she's not a vamp. She was brilliant. Not that kind of bullshit. But actually, 
that nothing that they said actually happened actually happened. And I can prove it with evidence. And so, yes, uh, since not enough people are reading my book <laughs> because I can't find it um, or don't know about it, uh, I want to do some shows here on YouTube to explain the different aspects. So under my historical playlist, I will eventually do Cleopatra. Um, I will do more than one. Normally I do one show on a case just because I don't want to be one of those true crime people that keep you know, pulling people along and talking about every single suspect that doesn't really exist. I'm going to do more on Cleopatra because I cannot explain the entire history of Cleopatra in one show. Uh, so I will do more on that. Um, so I'll be doing some historical stuff and I would definitely do Cleopatra. But if you want to read about Cleopatra and want to get all the details, yes, you can go to Amazon. Uh, the Murder of Cleopatra is there. Um, they have stopped printing the print edition. There is no audio edition. There is only a, let's say, there's one paperback edition, which is overpriced now. No, no, Kindle edition, which is overpriced, like near $20. I'm going to write to the Prometheus and say, geez, you know, if you're going to not like push my book, could you just drop the, the price to like $4.99? <laughs> you know, I'm good with that. Just drop it to $4.99 so people can read it. So I'm going to write Prometheus and see if they'll drop the price or give me my rights back so I can publish it for cheap. Um, I'm going to try to do that. But if you don't want to pay like 20 freaking bucks, um, you can also go to eBay and try to get like a used copy for like a book. And, uh, you know, I'm happy with that. I just want people to know about this. So uh, see what you can find out. <laughs> Snakes always get blamed. Well, you know, it's, 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 it's a cool demise. You know, when you want a cool demise, you got to come up with something. So yeah, that'll work. Um, there's an interesting YouTube video with a female Egyptologist who thinks Cleopatra was buried honorably. Yeah, I've heard this one. Okay. Uh, I know this one actually. Um, they've never, <laughs> um, that's speculation. And the reason I have problems with that is I know who it is and I know who is involved in it. And she, she did her best to go out and I actually went to the site. Ah, oh, it's in my book. If you go to my book, you'll see a picture of me at the site she was excavating. And I'm sitting there with an Egyptologist and I'm looking really cute and thin and young. And, um, well, I was young, but I was in my thirties. But uh, so I have a picture of me with there with the Egyptologist. Um, I saw the area. I think it's an interesting theory. I don't think there's any any proof of it, um, and she's never come up with any proof of it. It's one of those. See, I again, I stick with evidence. Um, she, I believe, she was murdered, and I don't know that Plut uh, Octavian, who I believe murdered her, gave a crap about that she got a proper burial. I, I believe that he just got her out of there you know um maybe she did maybe she didn't but i don't know if there's any proof and they've never found anything um so he could have octavian could have had her buried outside of town and said we're done the right thing by her i don't have an objection to that they just haven't found any evidence of it and so it's kind of like again not based on evidence but wishful thinking and i don't think anything ever came of it but i was there at the site so it was cool to be at the site it was very neat so very excited about you doing Cleopatra videos. The Kindle edition is surprisingly expensive. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, I'm like, what the heck? I, I, you know, an author has zero control over the pricing of anything. Um, it's nonsense. Uh, it's very frustrating. The, my book, The Profiler, on the other hand, has been dropped. Its Kindle edition has been dropped to $2.99. So I guess I just want to get some of their money back, the publishers. But um, Cleopatra went the other direction to 19 But look on eBay. I swear to God, I'm not going to make any money off this book if you buy it, okay? Um, I'm not. So I would just go to eBay and see if you can get a used copy for like a buck. That's that's my personal opinion on that. <laughs> so um, uh, thank you. That's really cool. Anna says, uh, if we absorb what Pat teaches us, we'll all be better able to evaluate real-life events in addition to crimes. Yes, I hope so. Um, because... You know, understanding how to analyze is it, there's, analyzing a crime is no different than analyzing something that happens in real life. And so often I wish that especially women would and men, I can tell you the truth, because I've seen some men hook up with women who don't analyze their what they're seeing properly. They're desperate for, let's say, they're lonely. Um, uh, they want somebody to be with them. Um, they want sex, whatever it is. And they, they don't understand. One of my favorite sayings on that is this. So, so there's a dude, he's like, 
let's say he's a divorced guy. He's been divorced for a while and he's, he's 50 years old and, and he's a, an average guy. Let's say he lives in an average home. Um, and he, and he, he decides to go online and they, he sees this woman and the woman says, I'm looking for a, an honest, he says, I'm honest and a hardworking guy. I'm hardworking and I like dogs. I have a dog and I love football. I have football. Uh, I love football too. And, and I just want to be with a guy. I can sit on the couch, pet the dog, bring my guy a beer and watch football. Hey, what guy doesn't want that woman? Right? <laughs> so he's like, I found her the perfect woman. And all she's doing is she's fishing. She knows exactly. And so the guy goes, okay. And he brings the woman home and he falls for her right away. And then she kills him and takes all his money because she's a black widow. And, and people say, well, how did he fall for? Her? Well, he fell for her because his needs, she, she, she put stuff out there that he, she knew it was baked for his needs. And, and he, and he went for it. Women do the same thing. Um, you know, they're lonely. They just want to be with somebody. They want somebody to appreciate them. And, you know, it's, it's so sad. Um, I was just reading a book. Let me see if I can remember all the names in this book. Um, I was reading a book on uh, the murder of Trotsky in Mexico. And anyway, the Spanish guy who's a, who's a, who's a, uh, he works for, he works for the Marxist Russian revolution. And he's a basically, um, you know, he's completely in the spy network and he is brought to, he's brought, he's in France and he's supposed to meet up with this woman who is a, a young woman who has been down to Mexico and is like really into what Trotsky has to say. And she's writing stuff for him and all that stuff. She's a young girl, not a real attractive girl. Let me put it this way. She's scrawny. She's, she's got big glasses. She's just extremely not attractive. I don't, you know, you don't want to say something bad about something, but you know, for a guy, from a guy's point of view, the girl was not attractive at all. And and so what happened was she's in a some Paris place and she's with a beautiful girl. And here comes this guy who's supposed to be Belgian, which he's not. He's a Spanish spy. But anyway, it's a very confusing story. But anyway, it's a true story. It's true. Absolutely true. Historical. And he's the one that ends up killing Trotsky in Mexico. He's sent to as an assassin. But he's try, he has to get this girl to bring him to Trotsky. So here's a beautiful girl and a really not good looking girl. And he goes to the ugly quote, ugly girl. And he goes, I really like you. And she's like, Oh my God, you know, some guy wants me over the beautiful girl and she falls for it. And she becomes his girlfriend and he suffers because he can't stand her. <laughs> and he thinks she's not attractive. He doesn't want to even be with her, but she is so thrilled that this handsome, rich Belgian, which, which he's not, is into her that she's, she falls for it all until she brings him to Trotsky and he kills Trotsky in Mexico. So it's a fascinating story, but it's all about a woman who, because she wanted something so badly, she was willing to buy what was sold to her, even though it was unlikely that that guy would really be as interested in her as she wished he would be. So we have a lot of that, you know, we can use understanding of criminals, psychopaths, and, and, and deceptive behaviors in our real life because they show up in our real lives. Not everybody's a killer, but we have psychopaths and personality, uh, people with borderline personality who can destroy our lives, can make our lives very difficult, all because we don't see, that, see it coming and, and we, just don't, we just don't know. So anything that you can learn from crimes that will help you out. I mean, I'm sure this poor girl had no clue. She had no clue what she was getting involved with. And I'm guessing she saw his behaviors, but she let she pushed them down because she wanted to be. I mean, she was being courted by a millionaire son. I mean, a millionaire. I mean, it's just, it was so amazing. So amazing. You know, so it's really sad. Let me look at one more thing and then I'm going to, oh, that's nice. I've seen the pictures of you in Egypt. You look very nice, but you still look cute now. <laughs> That's very sweet of you. Not quite true, but okay. See, I don't fall for shit like that. <laughs> I am totally aware of where I'm at now. Uh, and the nice thing about being where I'm at now is because I am just me. So anyway, let me look one more thing and then I'm going to head out. Um, and that says, personally, I think another person of persons were present at the reservoir. I'm, I'm not sure what I'm looking at here. Reservoir. 
what are we talking about? The boy fell in the war. Okay, I'm in a different, I have no idea what you're talking about. So, oh, somebody said, oh, Dr. Kunz's disappearance at the next show. I can't do that on the next show. I do have Dr. I don't know how to pronounce his name, Dr. Kunz. Uh, Mikey, I do have that one on the list. Um, I've got a long list now. <laughs> I can't believe how many people. There's so many cases where I've gone, oh, I know that case, but I've forgotten about it. Uh, and so it's on my list, and I'm going to try to get to them. I will eventually get to them all uh, over time. And uh, that's why I appreciate the support for the channel, because I want to be here long term. And in order to be here long term, I do need support for the channel. So, again, subscribe, like and, and go to Patreon and become a supporter, and uh, that would help a lot. Um, but I will try. I will try to get there uh, on that. Oops. Uh, and that's. But next week is Martha Moxley because I have been requested to do that, and I would like to talk about Martha Moxley because it's a very important case, and it shows how mis. Uh, you know, the misinvestigation in the beginning poor investigation. And then we had this book written, a couple books written about this, which leaned away from actual evidence and had, had a lot of fantastical theory in there. And that's it. <laughs> are, are you allowed to say Kunz? Um, I'm thinking it's Kunz with a long U. <laughs> so if it's not Kunz, I'm not pronouncing it the other way. <laughs> Yeah, I'm being very careful about that. Although I don't, I don't know what I think. I think YouTube is not too upset about uh, certain words. They're very upset about certain if you go, go too far into certain theories, uh, political theories, or uh, what they call conspiratorial theories, or theories that they you know they don't approve of. Um, then they then they can get knocked off of YouTube. But I'm not there. This is not a political channel, and I veer away from the political stuff. Uh, this is a channel to help understand how things work, how crimes work, how criminals work, um, and it's an educational channel. So I don't think I'm going to get knocked off anytime in the, in the near future. So, uh, yep, and I'm not sure. So anyway, I'm going to wrap it up for tonight uh, or today. Where are we on? What time is it? Oh, it's five twelve. Okay. Um, this was a really difficult case to talk about just because it should be like a 10 part series. So much information, just hard to even, I'm going to look back later and say, Oh my God, I didn't even cover no 70% of it. But um, I think I hope, hopefully I covered enough of it for you to understand what happened with the investigations, what happened with this guy's personality, what's likely. And, and some of the things that are, that are issues. Um, and uh, very fascinating. And I do think, I think we're going to find out that by the time they finish with this trial, I mean, he's, Robert, Robert um, is pretty darn sick and he's not that young anymore. When was he born? When was that guy born? Let me look at this up. He was born in 1943. He's 12 years older than me. That makes him 78. He's 78 years old. He's got kidney problems. He's got lots of problems. And I don't think they're fake. I think it got sick. Um, he's probably just going to either die before the trial ends or he's going to be so sick they're going to have to place him in a hospital. And he's never really going to, uh, he, you know, he's been, you know, he's not that he hasn't been in some jail situations, but because he has, but um, that he's ever going to pay for, quote, three crimes if he committed them, um, probably not. And that's a failure. Uh, first of all, the first, when his wife went missing, it was a poorly done investigation. There's no excuse for that. Uh, that he was not, that he was not investigated, that his house, his car, all that stuff was not done, that there was not a further investigation of, of anybody around him, his family, his friends, pitiful investigation. And I'm going to say maybe some politics were involved in that. Uh, the Berman investigation, I don't know how they didn't connect it back to him originally. Uh, yes, he could have been a hit on the mob. It's true. But that letter was so weird that they should have said, wait a minute, something freaky about this. Uh, and then, of course, they finally got him on, on, on uh, Morris Black, but then he got off because of this shenanigans of the defense team. But, you know, I think Robert Durst in, in cooperating with the, the Jinx film was the one who, he's the one who actually did the investigation on himself and he got himself into trouble. And that's why he's in tr trial now, but he's got really nothing to lose. And 
somebody asked, why is he doing this? Why did he go? Why did he make the phone call? Well, he wanted attention. He had nothing else left in his life. He wanted attention. He wants people to care about him, to listen to him. Uh, and sometimes it's worth going to prison over. It really is. I mean, you know, we, being nothing is not good as being something. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. Um, that's why children can act badly instead of acting well. They act, they do really good things and, and they're not paid attention to. Nobody, nobody appreciates them. You do bad things, you get attention. So people need to be recognized. Uh, and they're willing to be recognized as if your parents don't recognize you, you'll be a gangbanger. If your parents don't recognize you, you know, you might, be, you know, you'll get, you'll start doing something else uh, that because your parents, you know, your family is not there for you. So you'll be, you'll join a drug cartel. You'll join, you'll become a, you'll become a terrorist. You'll join one of the, you know, uh, one of the terrorist cells. Why, why do you, you know, we're in Afghanistan right now. You you know, I mean, the Taliban is, is, is rocking it. You know what I mean? They're rocking it. Where do they get those people? Well, have you ever been around those, some of those areas and you're living in a desert and you don't have a lot of hope and you don't, don't have, you know, you don't have opportunities for employment. Hey, joining the Taliban sounds like fun. You get a gun, you know, you get to go out and shoot people. You get to be cool. Might as well be in the Taliban. I mean, everybody's got to be somebody. So if we don't provide a way for people to be some healthy somebody, if parents don't raise their children to be healthy somebodies, they'll find a way to be somebody. And it's not a good thing. So anyway, oh, thank you. That's nice. Really enjoyed your Killing for Sport book. Talk about education on serial kills. Yeah, I wrote that book to get rid of all the mythology. And it was kind of a little bit sarcastic and tongue in cheek. But it was the point was to point out how we don't understand serial killers at all. We, 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 we've, we've glamorized them. We've Hollywoodized them. But we don't understand this is the way they think. So that's cool. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for giving Bobby a truer personality. <laughs> Fucked up lifelong. Yes, he was. He was definitely that way. Um, well, that's there's a truth to that. Janine says, uh, I don't blame Durst for running away and disguising himself when he found out Janine Pirro was after him. I, I, I don't either. I mean, in a sense, yeah, he 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 he, he thought he was he was being harassed um, in his mind. He was being harassed. He was being hounded. Uh, killing off Morris Black, of course, was probably not a great idea. It would have been better if he had run away from Morris Black. He had the money. He could simply disappear to the other side of the country. But in that moment, because he's got very poor control of emotions and his, you know, he gets easily carried away and angry. That's why he probably knocked off, uh, knocked off the Morris Black. So, but anyway, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to take off now uh, again. Uh, see you next week. Hopefully um, when I do Martha Moxley on Sunday, um, please do again. Like and subscribe and join Patreon. Uh, it, it really will help. Um, and we've got two levels, of, depending on what you're interested in. But any support for the channel. And if you want a good book, go there to the the, the description. Only the truth is my my mystery story. It's two ninety nine. You get a great read and you support the channel. And um, so please do that. And I appreciate you being here today. I love doing live and probably will continue to always do live because it's more fun than just talking to camera by yourself so this is this is better so anyway bye bye everybody thank you for being here you're awesome bye daniel bye everyone <laughs> and i will see you i will see you next week next week you know it's funny because uh i wonder what i'm doing here it's like you know they got these ending things so i'm gonna try to do an ending thing oh yeah here it is bye everybody <laughs>